What up and welcome to the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube pregame show. We are counting you down to first pitch at Comerica Park in Detroit. The Tigers and Brewers wrapping up a quick two game series. Detroit's won each of its last six games at home. Meanwhile, Milwaukee trying to right the ship. The Brewers have dropped 11 of their last 18 games. The offense has gone ice cold, but they have one of their emerging aces on the bump today in Corbin Burns opposite Matt Boyd, star lefty for the Tigers, who's gotten off to a slow start, but has begun to turn it around. The Tigers won last night, game one. Let's show you the highlights from the action. Reaches out, that's gonna drop. RBI single for Victor Reyes. Right back up the middle. Jamer Candelario delivers again. Romine is home. Reyes scores. Big inning for the Tigers here in the fifth. Six nothing Tigers are in the seventh inning. Swinging a fly ball, right field, way back in right and gone a home run. Man, his bat has been sizzling for over a month now. Home run number five. It's a four RBI night. Two run shot here in the seventh makes it eight nothing. Take your time, Jamer. When you hit it like that, he was slow out the box. I don't hate it. Al Leiter, Steven Nelson with you inside Studio 42. I got to be up here so I can get right. on your level, right. Al. Go hey, ahead. You're always jacked up. Anybody who watches you knows that. But you're especially excited this year because of the expanded postseason format. The Tigers, nobody expected them to even sniff the playoffs. But here they are, a game back. Right? So... We're upside down. Everything yeah. that's gone on with, with COVID and 60 game season, but I was hoping something irregular would happen. And if you look at what's going on, obviously we have, we have uh, a lot more teams in the playoffs with respect to that and having now fan bases that I believe if you were an Oriole fan or a Tiger fan or a Marlin fan, sorry, nothing wrong with that, but with, with respect to rebuild mode or however they want to term it with respect to these organizations and player development, but hey, listen, Steven, I, I, I mean, I think it is fantastic that we see what this looks like right here. Uh, you know, the Yankees have been reeling backwards, uh, certainly. The Blue Jays, I didn't mention them. I just like what I see here with knowing that the Orioles are half a game back, the Tigers are there one game. Seattle. Even in Seattle, <laughs> right. So, like, this is exciting. Obviously, if you're a fan of those respective teams, and then we could go over into the National League, and, you know, there's still kind of things, some upside down. I know we talked a lot about the Padres, but the Marlins, I think, are, are an exciting story. And here's the thing, you know, I mentioned the Brewers' struggles of late, but they're still just two and a half games back. So even though you're losing games in a season where it's always been, well, each game counts 2.7 more times than last year, Milwaukee still has a chance, and that is a team that has showed us in recent years that they can close. And they can close strong. That is true. That is true. And I think, I think again, this is good for the whole of the game with yes. respect to all of these fan bases that can then now rally in not realizing that, wait a minute, we have a playoff team. I grant that I, I understand not being able to go to the stadium and you're going to be watching on television, but I really like this. I do. For broadening the base of the fans. 100% with you. Al is at the top of our order. That is jam-packed. Kesson Huda of the Milwaukee Brewers is going to join us. Joe Jimenez of the Detroit, Detroit Tigers is along, along with Dan Plesak and Sean Casey. Let's show you now who are in the lineups for the game, the Game of the Week live on YouTube. First for Detroit, let's highlight the seven-hole hitter, Daz Cameron. Yes, Mike's kid making his big league debut, playing in the outfield. I'm, I'm also juiced to see Daz. Yeah, me got too. on the show. You know, that angle right there, I, I, I'm seeing, I don't know about you, a young Tory Hunter. I don't, I don't want to put that on him, but just Ooh, okay. kind of explosive pop off the bat, getting a chance now to come up. You mentioned his dad. I played with uh, his dad, Mike. Uh, exciting, electric. This guy was a top pick out of high school, going to Houston. I know there's been some injuries in circuitous route, but yeah. gosh, you'd love to see this. So that athletic, dynamic player to really take off. This was the hope and the expectation for a lot of Tiger fans that the future is now, 2020, and we're seeing that another top 10 prospect getting a taste of the show. Also, real quick before we go to Milwaukee's lineup, you talked about your history with Mike. Mike made his big league debut against you. Really? Yeah. Toronto White Sox. Do you remember the outing at all? No. You oh, don't? Did he get me? Right, let's take <laughs> no. Let's take you back. August 27, 1995. You had a day outlier. Seven and a third. Three hits. One earn. Walk four, but struck out seven and got the dub. Wow. Why and, couldn't I get through the eighth? 
Uh, that's that's for you. That's for you. <laughs> I to had think 400 about pitches. <laughs> I Mike went over, but Mike had a good career as well. So his boy Daz is on the Tigers lineup. Let's look at the opposition, the visiting Brewers. Christian Yelich, former MVP, batting third behind Keston Huda again joining the show, and Avi Garcia batting lean up, lead off. Al for Yelly. Again, you could say this about a lot of Brewers hitters. It has not been their year up to this point. He's still got nine dingers. Yep. So he's showing off that MVP pop, but the consistency putting it all together hasn't been there. So you being a lefty pitcher, how would you attack a guy like that knowing where he's at right now? Yeah. So listen, I, I, I tried to look into it because you look at his batting average bouncing right around 200. This guy's way better than that. Two years ago, MVP, 44 home runs last year. I mean, you got 100 plus RBIs two years ago. So how I would look at it, Stephen, is you got a guy that He's always been a guy that would be line to line. And I think when I think about Christian Yelich, his years with, with the Marlins and then uh, now with the Brewers the last three years, if you just watch here, guys that stay balanced, wait for the ball, breaking balls in, pull it, fastballs away. If I'm in a defensive count, go the other way with it. As you look there, 96 fastball away, go with it. If it's out, away, go away. You look at this, the beautiful swing, head down. He was always a guy that we talked about with respect to modern players' launch angle. Well, he really hadn't had much of a launch angle until the last couple of years. But I wanted to show this. Foot down, he's low position, his hands were back. But look at this. You couldn't get many, any more textbook than that right there. And he, he fires a ball to left center field. I love that. Here I wanted to just show. Here a little breaker. It's ball away. The ball away when he is right, like most 300 hitters, they pull it uh, when they're when they're when they're struggling with the 200 hitter. The ball away last year, the year before, he went the other way. If you just look at a few of these, that's what hitter. That's what pitchers try to do. But here's the breaker right here. You you miss something inner half. He's going to pull on you. And if you look where he stands, he's right on the plate, steps out a tad. But again, that's a beautiful swing. There's one thing that I see with Christian, and it's from the center field camera. He always has had a open stance cut slightly and land open. As a result of that, he's susceptible. If you watch here, his foot stepping out, really good breakers down and away, especially from the a lefty if you go body line. We'll see for Matt Boyd if he goes body line inside, it opens up that outer half, right? I threw in a couple righties there, but the down and away window, if you look here, the step out, that ball looks like, obviously, it is outside with nasty two-seam sink. It looks like it's even further. So I think for Christian, and I got a bunch of numbers for you, the, the hard hit balls, like he's at, he's at his high with respect to barreling baseballs, and that's the onus where when you try to look at what a guy's doing, hey, is he struggling? He's only bound 200. Whoa, 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 let's take a look here. You, yes, he's got some more swing and miss, but you have a guy with, with respect to hitting the ball hard, as you see there, identical uh, exit velo from last year to this year. I know it's a smaller sample. There, basically, what I'm saying, Stephen, there's, there's not a whole lot wrong. He's got the nine homers. Uh, batting average should be up. I would say when you look globally at a, or, uh, at a lineup, and I did it all the time, because when I'd go into a lineup, I'd look at it and say, okay, where am I going to stay from? Where are the soft spots? Yep. When you have a lineup that's struggling, I mean, they're third on the bottom with, with respect to team batting average. So they've had a tough time. And then the onus putting on a, a hero or a guy like Christian Yelich. I know Garcia was, was hot early on. He's yeah. moved down in the lineup. Jerko, like there's so I get the impression that you're saying that if this was a 162 game season, we wouldn't be sweating it as much. No, he'd have more at bats to go two for four, three for four. You know, that big day that we're talking here, six RBIs, yeah. you know, but now that it's crunched and then the, the focus is even more on the fact that they're not hitting because I'll tell you this Burns going in today. He's got stuff. Yeah, you feel good with Corbin Burns out there now. Oh, yeah. and Workman, and then you got Hader, and Williams on the backside with that Bugs Bunny changeup. You know, they could be, again, another scary team if they could get in. Yeah, Woodruff and Burns, 1-2. You get Yelich and Kessing going. Look out for the Brewers again. Just two and a half games back. The Tigers, one game back of a postseason spot. They're playing in Comerica today.
We're inching towards game time, the MLB game of the week, live on YouTube in Detroit. Al Leiter, Steven Nelson in Studio 42. And Al, before we see first pitch, we want to see one of the stars playing in this game. Let's talk to him right now. Kesson Huda of the Milwaukee Brewers, who's going to join us now on Ballpark Cam. Kess Daddy, as he's called. First things first, man, as a fellow Southern Californian and diehard Laker fan, did you watch the game last night? Oh, yeah. I, I caught the, I think it's halftime when the game ended, and uh, watched it on my phone on the bus ride back and the rest of it in the hotel. So, yeah, definitely caught it and uh, watched it through the end. Uh, we're hoping for a ship in L.A., but there, you're not, that's not the only <laughs> postseason you're locked in on. The Brewers, I know you've dropped three in a row, but you're still on the fringe of the postseason picture right now. So what's Count saying in the clubhouse to kind of get you guys ready for today and staying in the fight despite some struggles? Yeah, I mean, you know, past years you could tell that, you know, Brewers are a team that uh, performs in September. So, you know, we're looking to, to continue that this year. Um, you, know, you know, despite, you know, our performance so far, you know, we're, we're still right in it. And, um, you know, that definitely gives us a little extra motivation, um, you know, playing for the rest of this half of the season, uh, even though it's only 20 games left. But, uh, um, <laughs> no, but, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's good that um, – you know, we're still in it and we still have a chance, but, you know, at, at this moment, you know, every game even counts even more. Keston, I, I know it's not good to get large with uh, your thinking as far as a player, but I'm looking at your schedule down the stretch, and we know that the season's upside down, you guys being under 500, but is there a push knowing that you play the Cardinals now 10 times down the stretch to be mm -hmm. second so that you're not in that wild card pool? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, being able to, to have a lot of those games, um, you know, left on our, our schedule, uh, you know, division rival, uh, you know, a team that's fighting for a postseason spot as well. Um, you know, those games count even more now. Um, you know, I, a lot of them are going to be double headers now, so they're going to be quick seven inning games where, you know, you have to get jump ahead early on and, um, you know, keep that lead, you know, early on and often. So, um, you know, we're definitely have those have those games scheduled into our uh, our, our book or into our heads and, um, and definitely focus on those. Yeah, Keston, I, I, I watched an interview recently of yours, and you were talking about, look, last year you came on the scene, you were a beast, over 300. I know, you know, you're leading the team now in a 230 range. I'm sure the whole preparation and all the stopping and going, what happened this year, uh, messed with your uh, routine. But you mentioned something about being more upright, and you started leaning over a little bit. The nuance of your swing, has that been a little bit of a battle and a struggle for you a little bit? Um, I think, yeah, obviously, you know, the given year, uh, you know, I felt really good going out of spring training, um, obviously, given the, the circumstance with uh, COVID and, um, you know, the season giving pushed back, um, it definitely cannot like, hinders it a little bit. But, um, you know, it's a challenge that, you know, everyone had to face in this league. And, um, you know, De Steph definitely still trying to try to get everything to feel right up there. Um, you know, I noticed in, in some video that, um, you know, I was kind of leaning over, kind of quarreling too much where it was just getting me late to the ball and not putting my barrel in the zone, um, you know, where I want it to be, when I want it to be. So um, just a little tweaks and adjustment to, to kind of remind myself to, um, you know, to get that swing right. And, um, you know, it's, it's been feeling a lot better over the past couple weeks and, um, you know, hopefully looking to finish strong here. Yeah, just looking at your lineup again, I mean, it's, it, it should be, and, and hopefully for the Brewers' sake, uh, more potent than that with uh, looks like Yelich is kind of turning a corner as well. Uh, do you feel a little bit more, and I know you're a young kid uh, with respect to your big league time, a little more onus on your production leading, p passing the baton to a guy like Christian Yelich? Uh, you know, I think we we all put a our, we all hold ourselves to a standard where um, you know we know what we're capable of doing, uh, and you know obviously Yelly's a great player, uh, as you can see the past <laughs> yeah. you know, few seasons where. He,
you got other people involved that are you know, aren't in the game at the moment. Um, but you know, helps them stay locked in. So you know, when they do get in the game, that um, they're ready for every situation that comes to them. One more, Keston, before we say goodbye. Indulge me for a second. It's not often that I can relate to a big leaguer, whether it's Al or anybody we talk to. But we have some things in common, you and I. I can't hit a baseball like you. That's not where I'm going with it. <laughs> whether it's small coincidences like going to college in Orange County or our high mm -hmm. schools having the same mascot. But more important, more substantial than that is the fact that we're both half Japanese. We're Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. Our middle names are similar. We played in the same Japanese youth basketball league in the Southland, of course. Granted, you were San Fernando Valley. Yeah. I was VFW. Okay. Representing for our community and showing people mm -hmm. that they can not only get here but thrive here, that they belong, how much significance does that carry to you in your day-to-day? -day? Oh, it's a big, uh, big impact on my life. You know, growing up um, as an Asian-American, um, now, you're able to play different sports, like you mentioned. You know, VFW, San Fernando. Growing up in that in that community, you know, learn a little about your history, little, learn about your culture. Um, but you know, there, there's not many Asian Americans in this game, and um, you know, you can look at me. I'm not I'm not the biggest guy. I'm not the tallest guy. I'm not the fastest guy. Um, you know, but I think it definitely, if you put your mind to it, um, regardless of size. Um, ethnicity or whatever, you, know, you definitely can uh, achieve your dreams. And, um, you know, I was able to do that. And, you know, definitely going to use my platform to, to raise that. Love it, brother. Keep it going. A 1088 OPS last eight games. You and the Brew Crew, we know you guys finished strong. So thanks for joining us. And best of luck the rest of the way. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Heading third, playing right field. Number 21, Roberto Clemente. Number 21, he reflected what Pittsburgh was all about. I represent the, the common people of America. The person that he was still lives amongst the baseball community. I think that's great. I don't think I should ever die. Falling pretty fast out there. Caught by Clemente with a tremendous sliding catch. I hit him good most of the time I jump into the ball. And uh, I, I think I can hit all kinds of pieces. He could run. He could hit. He could throw. He could excite you. Say he's the greatest ball player I've ever seen. Roberto Clemente could do everything, a Hall of Fame player and humanitarian. Today, baseball celebrates Roberto Clemente Day. And Brent Suter of the Milwaukee Brewers, participating in today's MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube, tweeted this out. Looking forward to the day when we all wear this number and it is retired league-wide. Special thanks to the Clemente family for giving me their blessing to wear number 21 today. Happy Roberto Clemente Day. He is the pride of Puerto Rico. As we welcome you back inside Studio 42, Al Leiter and Steven Nelson here. And we want to talk to one of the Puerto Ricans on the field in Detroit today, Joe Jimenez, who's going to join us on the show right now. Joe, thank you for being here. I know you'll be wearing number 21 like Brent Suter and like Alex Claudio on the other side as well. Can you even put into words what that number means to you and the honor it presents for you today? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, it means the world, you know, because obviously uh, everybody, everybody knew what uh, uh, who Roberto Clemente was, you know. So uh, for us, the Puerto Ricans to wear number uh, 21 to honor him and celebrate his day is just, it's just amazing. Hey Joe, I, I was blessed and lucky and grateful to have won the Roberto Clemente Award, and I'm wondering, as a as a Puerto Rican player, was it what? made him so special for me knowing what he did off the field as a humanitarian but as as a young Puerto Rican player a person growing up in Puerto Rico what does Roberto Clemente mean to you if you had to put it in first few words I mean everybody everybody respected uh, uh, Roberto Clemente you know he, he was that guy that uh, you wanted to meet it doesn't matter if uh, if you know about baseball or not so um, I think he, he was unique. He was uh, the icon that Puerto Rico had uh, back in the day, and what he did for us and all the Latin community, it was, it was just amazing. There is a movement that's been around for a while of retire 21, and you saw Brent Suter tweet that out. He looking, he's looking forward to the day when it actually is. Is that, is that something that you believe as well, that the number 21 should be re retired across baseball? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's why that's why we're wearing number 21 today. You know, with the purpose of uh, retri retiring uh, number 21 uh, from baseball. So uh, yeah, I think it would be great. It would be great, and uh, I think Roberto Clemente family will appreciate that so much.
Hey, Joe, uh, to baseball today, you guys are playing better baseball uh, in, with the wild card the way it's set up right now. You're two games back from a playoff team. Um, How does that feel, and is it surprising a bit? Oh, no, I mean, we, we got a great team, you know. We got a, a great group of guys, and, and, and we got a, a lot of young guys that are hungry to win. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, I think we got a, a great team, and it doesn't surprise me at all that we are, we are playing baseball how we are right now. If you were to look at your individual 2020, Joe, we know it's not up to your own expectations here, but it's not about the numbers as we see them now, what you've done in past outings. It's about today and moving forward. What have you been working on of late to ensure that you're contributing at the best of your capabilities down the stretch? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now it's, now it's what it matters, you know, because uh, obviously what, what I do from now on, it's going to affect the game and, and, and it's going to determine if I'm go if we're going to the playoffs or not. So, uh, I mean, we all in that run now and we all playing good baseball. So we all going to contribute some to the game and, and obviously we're going to try to win games. All we can say is this, this expanded postseason format. It's awesome having all these teams in the hunt down the stretch, including you and the Detroit Tigers. So we wish you the best of luck. Uh, thanks for doing this today, especially on a special day around baseball, Roberto Clemente Day. Take care, Joe. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. The rookie Miguel Cabrera, his first game as a big leaguer. Delhi going back, still going. Going back is Garcia, looking, it's up, up and away, a two-run home run. The Marlins jump out to a two-to-nothing first-inning lead in game four. Triple crowns are very difficult to win, but Cabrera is one of the most feared right-handed hitters in all of baseball. Baseball's first triple crown winner in almost 50 years. The MVP the American League is Miguel Cabrera. Miguel Cabrera has done it again. On the ground, there it is. His 2,000th career hit as a Tiger. Joining that exclusive club, he joins Cobb and Kaline, Garinger, Heilman, Crawford, Trammell, and Whitaker in the old English D. Heard the line, one of the most feared right-handed hitters in all baseball. How about of all time, Miguel Cabrera? He ain't a baby anymore, fellas. You're 18 in the big leagues. Dan Plesak, Sean Casey are going to be with Scott Braun on the call for today's MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube. And Case, you just missed Miggy in Detroit. Just yeah. missed being teammates. Just missed him. I remember Jim Leland called me. I was the first baseman for the Tigers in 07. Jim Leland called me in with Dave Dabrowski after the, in the, with the White Sox. Calls me in the office and says, Case, we got to figure out how to get some, a first base with more pop. And I go, I just hit four homers. I go, you're right. You got to get me out of here and get someone in here that has some pop. Two weeks later, Danny, they brought in Miguel Cabrera. Turns out he has a lot more pop than I do. <laughs> and most right-handed hitters, most hitters in all of baseball history. <laughs> when, when I think of Cabrera early on with the Marlins, I remember when he was called up. And it's hard to take a teenager serious, right? Like, you hear all the mystique, like, this guy can hit, he has great power. I remember Ozzie Guillen. I was reading a quote when he first got called up. Ozzie Guillen saying that he thought this was the best hitter he had seen in a long time. And, but you don't know really how to take that. And the more you watched him, the more you watched, you were like, wow. Not the power. It was, it was the way that he could spray the ball to all fields. And he had an idea. He didn't swing at breaking balls that were in the dirt. And he, he reminded me a lot now of a present Juan Soto. Strike zone recognition, Sean. This guy, the reason, good hitters do one thing. They swing at a lot of strikes. And that's what this guy has done. He really has. You know, it's funny you say that about Soto because when I see Soto, what he does so well is he hits the ball to left center like a power hitting righty. That's been Miggy's big thing. If yeah. you've watched his career and really followed him as a hitter, he go, his power was right center and way back, right? And I think that's what made him a total hitter. You talk about a triple crown winner, MVP, and the reason he, the reason he was so good was that that right center gap, he lived there, which opened up the whole field for him, which then in turn we're talking about one of the greatest hitters of all time. And you know what the great hitters do, too? There was a time where nobody wanted to go to Detroit or Seattle yep. because run production. He couldn't drive the ball to the ballpark. <laughs> right. Miggy put on a Tigers uniform. You never heard him cry about, wow, that's a long way in right center field, <laughs> and you have to hit a bomb. He turned that ballpark into a small ballpark. I mean, two-time MVP, four batting titles, first triple crown the game had seen in, what, five decades, 50 years, 11-time All-Star. And it, 
it's a shame because I wonder if Gen Z, this latest generation, has lost the proper appreciation for Miggy because he's had some down years. He hasn't been healthy the last couple of years. That's why we got to remind them. It, it, it is too, and Sean, when you become primarily a DH, you don't see that familiar face. People don't remember. He came up as a third baseman. Yeah. This guy was a third baseman, and he was a quality first baseman, but Ron Gardenhire wants to keep him off his feet to keep his legs fresh, so he's primarily a DH. But there was a time this guy was a really good third baseman. He could make all the plays in a quality first baseman, yeah. Sean. Good athlete. I've mean, always been a really good athlete, and I think the injuries to his hips and his hamstrings over the years have kind of slowed down his power a little bit. But Guardy was saying, hey, listen, this guy is still a clutch hitter. He's one bet, one bet that well, has been one of the best clutch hitters in baseball history. And I think Guardy still loves that he's in the middle of the lineup because he brings a lot to the table, especially in big situations. Now, numbers and stats don't paint the full picture, especially when you're talking about one of the greats like that. But if you look at war, He's sandwiched between Clayton Kershaw and our own John Smoltz, and then OPS Plus, which I know you guys lock in and talking about hitters. He's tied with five guys Edgar Martinez, Willie McCovey, Pop Stargell, our friend and colleagues Jim Tomey, and Sam Thompson. All five of those guys are in the Hall of Fame. First ballot? 100%. Oh, no doubt. 1,000%. 1, yes, he's in. 1,000% okay. first ballot. Have you ever shared your story with Miggy, the, the other side of him coming to Detroit? Uh, I, you know what? I think I have. A few years ago on Intentional Talk, I shared it with him, and I said, Dave, do you know who the first baseman was before you arrived? And he said, yeah, I know it was you. So I was like, at least he knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you probably told Jimmy Leland and Dave, I get it. I get it now. Yeah, I After get it. He I came get it. Yeah. Here. Thanks for going to get him too, and not some bum. You know. What I mean? <laughs> hey. Well, Miggy and the Tigers—they're in the thick of this postseason race, the expanded postseason race in the American League, as are the Milwaukee Brewers. Case Sack. They're going to be in the booth with Scott Braun. First pitch coming up in a little bit. Al Leiter hopping back in the saddle with me. Al, Matt Boyd. We both have known Matty B for a while, and we talked to him a couple weeks ago on MLB Network. In the midst of his struggles, he has turned it around since then. How? Uh, you know, when I look at him, I, I think much uh, really comes off of his slider put away pitch. But his fastball this year, he's given up a lot of home runs. Yeah, a Steven. lot. Mm -hmm. uh, 11 home runs. And, and I think when you look at, when you think of yourself as a guy that has to be precise, I think what I've seen from him is that he's trying to make a pitch as opposed to making a pitch. There's yeah. conviction behind it. So whether you throw 93-ish as he does, now, now, now Burns is a different story. He'll, he'll run it up 98. You end up placing the ball, you become tentative, and then therefore you're not as aggressive. I'd like to see him t t today, and uh, I did get a chance to uh, work with him, be with him, whichever, up in the Cape Cod League when he was still in college. I love this kid. Uh, just to be more aggressive. Trust your stuff. And I don't mean by making mistakes. Knowing that you've given up a lot of home runs, yep. especially on your heater, you know, be aggressive, but be smart with it. Attack in a proper way. And I think that that's, that's the main thing, because from there, you expand and you put hitters away. Now, Boyd, his last three starts, 2-6-0 ERA. And he's got a guy who's been dealing all year long. Remember, think Ooh, back to the beginning like of last right year. Are you watching this? Too? Yeah, what is he doing right Staying now? Staying close. Reminding him, glove side, stay closed. Because if you flare open, the guys that try to throw it 100, as he does, and he can almost do it, that front side glove, as you're watching, that's a ball that you put on your front side. You also can put on the back side. It's telling him, take his elbow to his left hip so that he gets more of a Ferris wheel as opposed to a carousel. I like that. This is, you know, every guy has different routines and different, different uh, process and, and uh, preparation, but this is pretty good for a guy that can throw the heck out of the ball. And that 96-mile-an-hour average fastball. And he has. I mean, among pitchers with at least 30 innings pitched this year, only Kenta Maeda and Clayton Kershaw have a lower opponent's batting average than Corbin Burns. Yeah. He and, and he's putting it together because last year it was him and Brandon Woodruff, Woodruff and Corbin Burns. And Woodruff figured it out. He did not, but he's putting it together now. Well, he also had a little shoulder issue last year. So that, that, was, the, that was the bump in his, uh, in his ERA and just not as effective. When you're, again, when you're talking about a guy that relies on what I call the grunt pitch, and he does. But guess what? In addition to that, really good cutter, very good changeup. Yeah. And I like his slider. So, you know, I, I think it's going to be a fun matchup. Two teams fighting for a postseason spot, doing battle in Detroit. It's the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube. Scott Braun, Dan Plesak, Sean Casey, fellas, take it away.
It's an overcast day in Detroit, but this city is buzzing with playoff chase fever. Less than three weeks to go in the season, and the chaos level is pumped up to 10. Two ball clubs in the thick of a sprint to October. The final meeting of the season between these two teams in the Midwest. Fans will be checking it out from all over the globe. This is the MLB Game of the Week, live on YouTube in Michigan. The Milwaukee Brewers are in town to finish up a mini two-game series against the Detroit Tigers at Comerica Park. And welcome aboard to everyone watching worldwide on YouTube. I'm Scott Braun. We have our former Tiger, who was sensational in the postseason with Detroit, Sean the Casey. Good old days. <laughs> <laughs> good old days for Dan Plesak in Milwaukee, a three-time All-Star with the Brewers. That was many moons ago. Those were <laughs> further than the good old days, Scott. <laughs> well, let's focus on the present now, shall we? And we'll start with this YouTube broadcast that is streaming live globally on MLB's YouTube channel for free. This is the second game of September that we're doing here and then two more to follow. Join the over 2.5 million other fans in subscribing to the MLB YouTube channel. Click the bell icon to receive notifications prior to games and YouTube TV customers. Oh, it's a treat for you. Game stream live in an MLB pop-up within the channel guide. So, okay, let's focus on a matchup with two teams that are in the thick of a playoff race. And for the Milwaukee Brewers, Dan, Christian Yelich has not been his MVP self. They rely on him to click offensively on a daily basis. What are you seeing? Uh, a guy that's stuck in between right now, Scott. He's a little bit behind the fastball. He's a little bit over aggressive. More swings and misses in 2020 than I can recall the last couple of years. His career turned around when he put on a Brewer uniform. A tremendous player with the Marlins, but turned himself into an MVP player with the Milwaukee Brewers. Big home runs. Lots of different kinds of swings. He's had a difficulty catching up to the good fastball that's up out of the zone. Makes himself vulnerable for that breaking ball down and in. It's some part of the game that we haven't seen from Christian Yelich. He struggled early, and it's continued as we moved into the month of September. And if the Brewers want to get back into this race to claim one of the wild cards, they're going to need their former MVP to get going quickly. And this is what I'm talking about. When they win, he thrives. 267, 11 extra base hits. The OPS north of 1,000. Speaking of thriving, the Detroit Tigers are just one game out of a playoff spot in the American League behind the New York Yankees. What's been working so well for this team? Yeah, can you believe it? These guys are right where they want to be with Gardner leading the way. Listen, they, they, in the middle of that lineup, Jamer Candelario, this guy has been an absolute stud so far. Look at this. Since August 1st in 32 games, 364, 17 extra base hits, 23 RBIs, is absolutely getting after and leads the NL and that's in AL and that's Man, I'll tell you what, middle of the order, he's been doing his things and really getting after it. Willie Castro, man, this guy has been great too. 364 leads AL rookies in, 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 in each of the categories, minimum 65 plate appearances. But I tell you what, electric young kids. This kid's 23 years old, Willie Castro. Candelario is 26. Scope at the top. This lineup has been really, really good so far. The future is definitely, definitely bright. You can see right here the, with the young guys, Castro, Candelario, Casey Mize at 23, Paredes at 21, and Scooball at 23. So the future is definitely bright for the Detroit Tigers. Four of their top seven prospects are on the big league club right now. That includes Daz Cameron, who is in the lineup, gets called up today, yes. and we'll see him very soon. And let's head to the ballpark and check in with Mr. Midwest. J.P. Morosi has more on why today is such a special day in the baseball world. Hello, J.P. Good afternoon from Detroit. A moving moment here just a short time ago. Every player on the field stopping during their warm-up to watch the tribute video to the great Roberto Clemente. The unique concept behind this year's honoring of Clemente began nine months ago with the hiring of Derek Shelton as the manager of the Pirates. Shelton thought that everyone on his team, Clemente's team, should wear 21 on Clemente Day in 2020. And so tonight in Pittsburgh, the Pirates will do so. Also around the major leagues today, nominees for the Clemente Award, including Milwaukee's Brent Suter here in Detroit, will wear number 21. Players of Puerto Rican descent around the major leagues welcome to do the same. Joe Jimenez of the Tigers and Alex Claudio of Milwaukee. This is also, Scott, a somber day as it's the first Clemente day since the passing of his beloved wife, Vera Clemente, last November. 
Vera Clemente worked as a global ambassador for goodwill for Major League Baseball, keeping her husband's legacy alive for nearly a half century after his passing. It's that example of philanthropy, of caring the most for those who have the least. That remains such a huge part of the Clemente family legacy today. It's that legacy, Scott, that everyone in the baseball family, from those in uniform to those at home, still aspire today. Scott. A legend on and off the field. We'll talk about the legacy of Roberto Clemente this afternoon. Brewers Tigers coming right up live on YouTube. And here's more on number 21 with Jason Stark, Harold Reynolds, and Pedro Martinez. What does Roberto Clemente and Roberto Clemente Day mean to each of you guys? Harold, let's start with you. Well, for me, I, I was a recipient of the Roberto Clemente Award, and, and it represented what you meant on and off the field. So that was quite an honor. But it went deeper because I knew who Roberto Clemente was. Uh, my brothers were Roberto Clemente <laughs> fans. The first glove I got handed down to me was Roberto Clemente glove. Oh, really? Yeah, and, and as, as a youngster, uh, we grew up in the, the day and age, Jason and I, Pedro, you're a little younger, where it was like one game of the week. And so the playoffs were and World Series were it. So I remember watching Roberto in the World Series against the Orioles and stuff like that. I mean, that's just burning my mind. So I knew Roberto Clemente, the player, and then to learn about the man later and receive that award, it, it, he, he stands right up here at the top. Very cool. Pedro, what about you? Uh, before I even got into real baseball, I had my own man my uncles, everybody talking about what he meant. And, and uh, Roberto Clemente is the prime example for all of us. Before we even knew what community work was, mm -hmm. before we even knew uh, that, that baseball was a second thought to, to Roberto Clemente, and Roberto was uh, the symbol of, of all good things that, that you can have as a baseball player and as a human being. And, you know, Pedro, you're obviously not from Puerto Rico, but I don't know if people realize the impact that he had on baseball across Latin America. H how would you describe his impact on baseball in Dominican? Roberto Clemente is the biggest icon that ever passed through Latin America, and he, he will always be. So uh, as, a, as a Latin player that I, that I am, I'm so damn proud to have known about the, the history of, of Roberto Clemente and the legacy he left. That was great stuff. And you can see the Roberto Clemente Day logo on all the bases, the dugout lineup cards today. It's the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube at Comerica Park. Overcast Wednesday afternoon for some baseball between the Brewers and the Tigers. It's the final of the season series between these two teams. The Tigers have taken the first two of three. They split the series last week, and the Tigers won yesterday by a final score of eight to three. And you can see Alex Claudio wearing number 21. Number 21 for a number of players across Major League Baseball. We'll get into that as we continue along here. Let's start with the Milwaukee Brewers, the visiting starting lineup. Abisail Garcia back yesterday, and he's in there again today. Keston Hira leads the team in home runs. Christian Yelich has big-time numbers against the Detroit Tigers. Jed Jerko at first. Ryan Braun back in the lineup, and he's the DH. He's been battling back issues. Orlando Arcia at short. Luis Arias at third. Tyrone Taylor gets another start in right field. And Jacob Nottingham will catch today for Corbin Burns. And Matt Boyd is on the mound. The left-hander's ERA doesn't look pretty, but Dan, lately he has been figuring it out again. His last two starts have been better, Scott. I think one of the keys for Matt Boyd is keep the ball in the ballpark. He's had a very difficult time giving up runs in the first inning. We had a chance to talk to Ron Gardenhire before the game. He would like to see him use a better variety of his pitches. He thinks at times he gets too happy with either the fastball or the curveball. He's going to mix in more sliders this afternoon. Expect his pitch area to be a little bit different. Statcast powered got by Google Cloud. Four seamers, sliders. That changeup was money for him in his last start. Also, occasionally a curveball and a sinker. Back to back quality starts. Both of them coming against Minnesota. Both of them six innings, four hits, two runs, and six strikeouts. So, Matt Boyd 
in his last couple starts, looking like the pitcher that we saw in the first six weeks of last season for Ron Gardenhire's club, 16th major league season in the managerial world and third season managing the Tigers, a Detroit team checking in at 19 and 21 on the year, while the Milwaukee Brewers last night fell to 18 and 22. They've dropped three in a row, but you know Craig Council in September turns it up a notch as the Brewers last year were 20 and 7 in September, same record the year before. I love asking the council today about how he mixes and matches too, because when you have a two month season and you have a guy struggling like he has in his lineup, you know, I like him. He was saying, I got to play the hot hand. I got to figure out how to win ball games down the stretch. You know, they're running out of time. And I like how he's trying to figure out, you know, he, he was talking about Jerko. I'm giving Jerko more at bats because he's hot right now. We are underway in Detroit, and Abisail Garcia swings through the 0-1 pitch from Boyd. You look up and down the lineup, Sean. These averages are really down. Abisail Guerrero, 227. Keston Hira. Then you look at Kristen Yelich at 213. That's a high water mark. Ryan Braun at 205. A team that hit a lot of home runs, and we talked about the great month of September last year, and they did that without Yelich, who was injured. So, and a good start for Matt Boyd to that. Another high fastball up in the zone. He elevates and picks up the strikeout. Yeah, I just think with this lineup, Danny, it's, it's uh, you know, it's one of those things. Hitting is very contagious. And, you know, you see right here Garcia swinging up and out of the zone. But hitting is contagious. And a guy like Yelich that is hovering around 200 all season long, I just feel like when Yelich goes, his lineup goes. And if he could just really get hot, I bet you a lot of these other guys would get hot too. Yelich on deck for Keston Hira. 11 home runs, best on the squad. He's hit safely in seven of his last eight. He's been turning it up more lately, but the strikeouts have been up for a contact heavy hitter. Strong on base percentage. He's been getting beat up in the zone this year. Ninth overall pick back in 2017. You know, it's it's funny when you talk about getting beat up in the zone and, and swinging at pitches up there. That's why that average is 118. That is not a, a, a pitch that you can really get on top of, especially at the big league level. Man, it's just a pitch you don't want to swing at. And for me, when I look at Hira, you know, struggling a little bit average-wise with the chase rate on pitches up, that just tells me maybe sometimes there's a little anxiety there where you're swinging at that pitch up in the zone. Four-pitch walk. And one aboard for Christian Yelich. That's been the story for the Brewers offense. Pressing this year. Strikeout numbers are up. They will take a walk. Patient approach. And here's the 2018 MVP. First pitch getting the over curveball right there. That's one of the things that you didn't see very often in 2018 and 2019 that get me over first pitch breaking ball to a guy like Yelich. We talked about it in the pregame. He's in a that bad place to be Sean that in between he's a little bit behind the fastball and out front on the breaking stuff. Man Dan as a as a hitter that is the worst place to be. Y you feel like do you want to swing do you not want to swing. I know for me when I was in between like that with that mentality a lot of check swings you know and that's what you see from yellow it's just a little indifferent a lot of indifference right now up at the plate. He's been rolling over on many baseballs and that's why suddenly most teams are shifting against him there are three infielders on the right side. Good example of that last pitch right there a 1 1 fastball right down Broadway. It almost looked like he was expecting a breaking ball from Boyd. I was thinking the same thing. I mean, I guess what are you looking? What are you looking for? But sometimes, like you said, when you get caught in between that fastball, it's right there. You just can't pull the trigger on it. I thought what made him so dangerous the last couple of seasons, Sean, lefty on left, was that fastball that was up out over the plate, particularly at Miller Park. He had the ability to drive that ball into the seats. Those were long fly balls at a ballpark in Miami. And then if you make a mistake and you throw that ball down and in, he'll pull that ball so that's what's made him so dangerous and it just looks like now he, he's just a little bit more tentative than we've seen him the last couple of seasons. You take a look at that swing right there late on the 94 mile an hour fastball. It almost leads you believe is he stuck in the middle Sean or is he's sitting on a breaking ball and this pitch is pretty much middle middle outer third and up and he hits this 
over the third base dugout. See how that ball is really deep in on him right there? Yep. Down on the one two. Well, I mean, you know, right there, that, that that combination from Boyd, you know, obviously as a as a lefty on lefty, I'm trying to kind of stay on this slider curveball right here. And and you know, for for a guy like Yelich who's in between right now, he fouls that fastball off 94 on that last pitch, and Boyd kind of sets him up for that slow roll right there, Danny. Saw very few swings in 2019 like that from Christian Yelich. Had a really good two-strike approach. I remember the last swing of last season for Christian Yelich. He fouled the ball off of his kneecap, ended up fracturing it on September 10th. Missed the rest of the season, including the wild card game, a loss for Milwaukee. Jed Jerko has earned himself every day playing time. There's been a carousel at first base. Remember last year, a lot of time for Eric Thames. This season, Logan Morrison. Brock Holt and Justin Smoke both were cut. Holt's actually swinging the bat very well with the Nationals now. You know, in a big part of this Brewers lineup, Lorenzo Kane opted not to play in 2020. And it really, Christian Yelich is the most important player, but the heart and soul of this Brewers team, Sean, had been Lorenzo Kane. Wow. Runs and goes and gets him down in center field. Not a prototypical leadoff type guy, but kind of sets the table in a winning player. He brought that attitude from the Kansas City Royals. To the Milwaukee Brewers and the Brewers miss him in that lineup. Well, especially with a with a with a sprint the sprint that we have this year, Danny. Two months. You need guys with that energy. You need guys to bring it to the ballpark. There's no fans out there. Uh, Lorenzo Kane would have definitely brought a lot to this clubhouse. That's the good changeup you were talking about in the pregame, Scott. One of the pitches that Ron Gardenhire hopes that he mixes in. He fills at times. He gets. Fastball happy or curveball happy. He'd like to see him use all three of his pitches. Really good 2 1 changeup right there to Jerko. That was the big pitch for him in his last start against Minnesota. It's been a big pitch for Tigers hurlers lately. This has been the problem spot, too. If Matt Boyd can get past the first inning, he is a much different pitcher after that point. It's a pretty good pitch right there. I know, Sean, I'm begging him here being a former pitcher, but I want that one right there. That's a really well located changeup. <laughs> That's almost unhittable. Look at those first inning numbers. ERA north of 10. And another walk. So two strikeouts and two walks from Boyd so far. And, and as a pitcher, you kind of know what your tendencies are. If you've had a difficult time like Matt Boyd has had in the first inning, you see him taking a look at his cap right there. You try to do different things warming up. You try to pretend you're throwing to the first hitter of the game. Get yourself in a mental frame of mind. And sometimes it's just a matter of fact that you just have to work through every pitcher every hitter has something that they're uncomfortable with and a lot of times if you get to a good starting pitcher you have to get to them early and it's been a problem for Matt Boyd getting out of that first inning and it's not getting any easier with Brian Braun coming up with two runners on. You know there's only been one pitcher that has given up back to back home runs to start a game this year and that is Matt Boyd and it's happened to him three times to further emphasize the first inning troubles for him. Danny, is that is that just a mental thing? You it know is, what I mean? It is, Sean, and, and you you try to combat it. You, you take a look and, and listen. If he knows, two things have been a problem: the first inning and home runs. He's allowed 50 home runs since the beginning of 2019. So you have that bugaboo of keeping the ball in the ballpark, and you want to try to go out there and get a clean first inning if you can. And now his pitch tone. This will be his 20th pitch, and he. Good fastball there to Braun. He jammed him. And Matt Boyd strands the two runners and gets through the first unscathed. We'll introduce you to the Tigers lineup coming up on YouTube. Corners in one away. Reaches out. That's going to drop. RBI single for Victor Reyes. Right back up the middle. Jamer Candelario delivers again. Romine is home. Reyes scores. Big inning for the Tigers here in the fifth. Goes the other way. That's going to drop. 
One run is home. Here comes Candelario. He's going to score. Bonifacio jumps on the first pitch. Another two-run single. 6-0 Tigers here in the fifth. 6-0 Tigers are in the seventh inning. Swinging a fly ball. Right field. Way back in right. And gone a home run. Man, his bat has been sizzling for over a month now. Home run number five. It's a four-RBI night. Two-run shot here in the seventh. Makes it 8-0. Jerko into left field. It falls in for a base hit, and the Brewers finally get on the board. This one hit well. This will get into left field a base hit. Another run coming home for Milwaukee. And another run coming home for Milwaukee here in the ninth inning. It's an 8-3 to three game. Foul territory. Paredes has room. Tigers win it. 8-3. A scoreless first inning for Matt Boyd, and now it'll be up to Corbin Burns on the Milwaukee side. Afternoon action at Comerica Park. And Matt Boyd worked through a scoreless first. Corbin Burns turn on the mound, and he's going up against this Detroit Tigers starting nine, which features Three switch hitters today. Victor Reyes is one of them. Jonathan Scope in the lineup despite leaving yesterday's game. Miguel Cabrera, Jamer Candelario, Willie Castro wearing 21 today for Roberto Clemente Day. Jorge Bonifacio in left. It's the debut this season for Daz Cameron. And then there's backup catcher Grayson Griner and Isak Paredes to round out the nine. That makes me feel old right there, Bronny. I was with Daz Cameron. I played with played with his dad, you know, when he was uh, in, in in 1999 when when Daz was, I think, two. So <laughs> we asked Craig Council about it as well. He said he saw him running around as a kid and said, "That's a big leaguer." So here's Corbin Burns, Dan, making his sixth start, and in his first five, his ERA is under two. That earned run average includes three relief appearances as well. He's finding it. He is. And, and Craig Council right now feels that he has two really productive starting pitchers. Brandon Woodruff has looked at as their ace, and Corbin Burns off to a good start, too. No, you saw that ERA of 2.35. In the past, he's had a lot of trouble getting the ball away from his arm side. He's really good throwing the ball into lefties, away to righties. He's strong towards his glove siding. Craig Council told us before the game that he's been able to move his fastball on both sides of the plate, so he's not as one sided. Right handers expected the ball away. Left handers expected the ball in. And now he's working both sides of the plate. That's made him a vastly improved pitcher. One of the things that hurt him, Scott, was he had a lot of success when they initially called him up out of the bullpen. And so, you know, this was a, this is an organization much like the Rays that they felt like they their bullpen was so strong with Josh Hader and and the likes that he pitched so well. And as Craig Council calls his bullpen guys out getters. He was the type of guy that could give you multiple innings, so he was valuable, but they saw him long term more as a starting pitcher. Nine innings, two runs out of the bullpen in the 2018 postseason. This is last year. The home run rate, 3.1 per nine. That is sky high. And this year he's given up just one long ball. Well, one of the things is that his package of pitches is a really good mix. He's 93 to 96 miles an hour, and he'll cruise all day long at 95. He's used more cutters and sliders, and his changeup has gotten a lot better. And on top of that, there's a really good pitch right there. Outer third, right on the corner. You know, when I look at Corbin Burns, and I think about, you know, his stuff, you know, 38.1 innings pitch, 53 punch outs. That, that tells me he's missing a lot of bats. And when you can throw a pitch like this right here out on the outside black at the knees, man, that's, that's a, so tough to pull the trigger for a hitter because that's just a perfect pitch. Victor Reyes was giving a scouting report to Miguel Cabrera, who's now on deck, as he was walking back to the dugout. He said nasty. <laughs> Cabrera said, what'd you see? Nasty. <laughs> Jonathan Scope in that, the two spot. And that last pitch was the difference in Burns' this season. That fastball that's away to a lefty, he had a difficult time doing that last year. Everything pulled towards his glove side so if he's able to throw both sides of the plate it's going to make that plate a lot wider and he'll pitch deeper into this game.
Scope left yesterday with a right wrist contusion. This has actually happened quite frequently in the season series between these two teams. Jacoby Jones hit by a pitch and actually broke his hand and went down for the year. This was yesterday. Scope with the bruise leaves the game and then right after the contest goes up to Ron Gardenhire and says, Skip, I'm playing tomorrow. He said it just like that, with that tone. Well, you know, I think one thing about one thing about Scope, and I love what Guardy was saying, was when, when a guy like this, 2016, played 162 games. That is so hard to do, being an everyday player, realizing how tough it is to play 162. You have to have a certain mentality, and that's why Scope's back in the lineup tonight, because he was like, no, you know what, that's not going to keep me out. Rolls one to the left side. And it's a foul ball. You know, a lot of people forget that uh, Jonathan Scope was acquired by the Brewers at the trade deadline in 2018. And he really didn't get a chance to play much for the Brewers. I was quite shocked because I thought he and Machado were as good a third base shortstop combination, second base as there was in the game. Acquired by the Brewers, they acquired him along with Mike Moustakis. A lot of people thought the Brewers needed more pitching and they went the other way offense. And Jonathan Scope lost a lot of playing time in 2018. And last year he had a productive year with the Minnesota Twins and he's found a home in Detroit. Doesn't bite on the one two. Jonathan Scope is a big power hitting second baseman who comes from Curacao and actually plays for the Netherlands in the World Baseball Classic. A Little League champ, an all-star in 2017. He signed a one-year deal for $6.1 million in the offseason with the Tigers coming off 23 home runs last year with the Twins. You know, it's funny when you think about Jonathan Scope. He's been in Baltimore, been with the Brewers. Or was he with the Twins? Twins, Twins, last, Twins last, last year. year same now division. he's with the Tigers. You, you, you think this guy's, you know, had a long career so far. He's only 28. <laughs> you know what I mean? You think maybe he's in his 30s, still has a lot of ball left, 28 years old, and still has a lot of thunder in that bat. Payoff from Corbin Burns. You mentioned that cutter that Burns has, Dan. He used that cutter eight times last year, just toying with it, trying to make it part of the repertoire. Now it's his second most used pitch. Well, last year in 2019, the guy you're looking at right there, he just had a difficult time. He had lost some confidence, bounced around from the bullpen, back into the rotation, back and forth, and never really had a home. And he's a guy that looks like, so far, he's pitching with a lot of conviction, hitting the glove. It's been terrific. Good look at his arsenal. 37 percent of the time he's going to throw that hard sinker it's 94 to 96 miles an hour the four seamer down at the bottom of your graphic only throw about three percent of the time that's a pitch he'll use 0 2 1 2 to try to ride a fastball about chest high to get a swing and miss stat cast powered by Google Cloud and let's see if he racked up another strikeout he did scope goes around wow I'll tell you what right there the pitch in the scope he goes cutter away 92 sinker in at 97 and then wipe out slider right there. Uh, you know, when you're a hitter and you, that arsenal hits you three pitches in a row, those are the kind of swings you get, Danny. Uh, what happened? He's throwing, he throws so hard, too, Sean, that you have to honor the fastball. And it makes that cutter, and it has really tight rotation. It's a hard pitch to pick up. The key is you have to throw that pitch to make it appear that it's going to be a strike. If it's down in the zone or if you spike it into the left-hander's batter's box, a right-handed hitter, the ball never appears to be a strike. Right. Now the big man, Miguel Cabrera, goes after the first pitch and sends it to center. Avisail Garcia working with it, and he finds it. Three up, three down for Corbin Burns, including two strikeouts. We are scoreless after one between the Brewers and the Tigers at Comerica Park. Coming back. Swinging and a rocket to center, deep and going to be off the wall out there. And it is gone for Keston Hira. Eight homers driven in 18. There's a swing and a drive. Center field. It's a one run game. The Brewers have him on the corners with one out for Keston Hira. One down here in the seventh. And Hira swings at that first pitch, right field, back to the wall, off the wall. And the Brewers are going to take the lead. 
Urea scores. Wow. And Milwaukee out in front, two to one, as Keston Hira comes through. Hira had that double back in the seventh inning. 3 0 pitch. Swing and a high fly. Deep left field on a 3 0 pitch. Keston Hira goes deep. A two run shot for home run number 10. Keston Hira makes his way to the plate. He will lead off. This one hit to right, all the way back, and gone for Keston Hira. That shot right out of here for a leadoff home run. And the 11th on the season for Hira. This ballpark in the Motor City is a gem. Detroit, Michigan for the Brewers and the Tigers. They really built that well. Oh, they really did. This was a great, great place to play. I was, I was so fortunate to play when we went to the World Series in 06, and and I, and I had a good team in 07. But in 06, I've never experienced anything like a city going as crazy and fanatical as it was in Detroit. I'll never ever forget. They're etched in my, my etched in my brain the, the excitement there in 2006. Scott Braun, former Tiger, Sean Casey, former Brewer, Dan Plesak. You hit like 500 oh, in that postseason. So too. lucky. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you, Don Slott, Andy Van Slyke, for all those, all the time going in the batting cages, getting me locked in. I'm so, so thankful. I went back to, I remember going back, and Randy Johnson, I hit a double off Randy Johnson in the ALDS. And I was on second base, and Joe Torrey was coming out to take Randy Johnson out. And Danny, th th that song, -na 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 -na, hey, was playing. And I look up, and all I can see is a sea of orange towels. You couldn't even see a human. Just a sea of orange towels going nuts. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, this is, look at the mayhem that's going on here. And I was like, yeah, I'm kind of proud I created the mayhem in Detroit. But it was, it was, it was unbelievable. Had a chance to play for an all-time great managers too, and Jim Leland, right? I mean, one of the greatest guys, guy. One of the greatest Hall of Fame should be a Hall of Famer, Jimmy Leland. He was one of the best, best managers I've ever, I've ever played for. And you want to talk about a, a player's manager? You got a chance to play for him too, Danny, right? In Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah. <laughs> he loved talking horses with you. He was, <laughs> you know, I, I was fortunate in my career. I, I had a chance to play for some great managers: Phil Gardner with Milwaukee, Tom Treblehorn. Orlando Arcia sends one to left, and that's going to fall for the first hit of the day and skip over the wall. It's a ground rule double for the Brewers shortstop. You know, Craig Council was telling us before the game that Arcia has hit into some bad luck this year, coming into play batting 234, but he said he has taken a lot of good swings. He's had some really rotten, rotten luck, but uh, there's a swing right there. Keeps his hands in on a fastball that's in. This ball cutting in action, keeps his hands in and barrels it up, and one hops the wall for a double. You know, one thing when you're a hitter and you're hitting the ball well, you're hitting the ball hard, but you're not getting any luck. You do know your job is to, to hit the ball hard every time up. And, and if you consistently keep doing that, you're eventually going to get your hits. And that's where RC is keeping his confidence going, knowing that he's been swinging the bat well. Opponents leading off an inning, reaching base 50% of the time against Boyd this season. And we see that happen again here. That actually happened six out of the nine innings yesterday for Milwaukee, but they didn't score until the ninth inning, putting up three runs and falling 8-3. You know, you talk about the difference with this Brewers team in 2020. A lot of home runs, not in that lineup that were in the lineup last year. Mike Moustakis, who departed via free agency to the Reds. Yes, Manny Grandal signed the big contract with the Chicago White Sox and Eric Thames now with the Washington Nationals three big bats in that lineup Sean it's hard to replace that kind of thunder. Now it really is those guys uh, you know we talk about big bats like that and they they are definitely struggling uh, this season with the with, with the home run numbers they lost three of their top four home run hitters the three that Dan mentioned. Here's Luis Arias and he shoots a ball to left. And that finds some open space and that'll score the first run of the game. Arcia trots home. It's an RBI double for Luis Arias. One nothing Milwaukee. Good hustle right there by Arias too. That's a ball that got in the gap didn't shoot it. And Arias does a great job of getting out of the box fast thinking double right when he hit it, he thought I'm getting I'm getting a two great piece of base runner right there.
That's a pro slide as well. There's another pitch that's up in the zone from Matt Boyd. Arcia able to just stroll in as you touched on a great pop up slide by Urias into second base. And he's off to third. And they got him. Nice throw from Grayson Griner to erase the base runner. Tell you what, that was a no look right there. Urias was off. Boyd didn't do a very good job. It looked like he had this bag stolen easily. See, no look right there. He's off to the races. What a strong throw and a great tag to get that slap tag right down by Paredes. Oh, he's, he's blocked, blocked by, his, by the leg right there. Put the left knee down in front of the bag. No place for Urias to get that hand in. Great catch and a great throw. Man, you wonder too, Danny, you know, I, I just, you know, no no outs right there. You've just had two back-to-back -back doubles. You know, the, the old adage, never make the first or third out at, at, at third base. You know, I don't love that move unless you're 100% sure you can steal a base right there. I don't love it. You know, I think particularly, Sean, in 2020, where in the National League, even though this is the American League ballpark, you're playing with the, the DH rule. You could make a case, maybe if you were playing at home in the National League, you want to try to get that runner to the third base as quickly as you can. But you just have to make sure with nobody out, you're going to swipe third. You better make sure you can make it easy. And that's usually what happens. Oh, there's another one. Similar spot. Tyrone Taylor drives it, and he is going to end up at second base. It's a one out double. Well, there's that run right there, where we, like we were talking about. You know, Arias trying to go to third base. And, and he ends up losing. Uh, they lost a run right there with him getting thrown out. Three consecutive doubles off of Matt Boyd. All of them going to left field. Taylor now ending up at second. You know, Boyd kind of struggled through that first inning. Threw 20 pitches to get through that first inning. Only 11 of those were strikes and balls up in the zone. Back-to-back -back triples by Arcia Urias and now Dyrone Taylor. And Bruker a chance to try to maybe get some separation here in the second inning. We apologize for the technical difficulties we're experiencing in Detroit. We'll use this feed for now and keep you posted. Here comes Jacob Nottingham, the nine hitter for Milwaukee. 2020, roll with us, people. If you're Ron Gardenhire right now, you, you had a game last night where you're able to get through it, an easy 8-1 to one win. We talked to both managers, both bullpens ready to go this afternoon. That shouldn't be an issue, but I'm sure Ron Gardenhire would love to see Matt Boyd get through four or five innings and take some pressure off of that bullpen. This is the view you're looking for, Dan, to see every pitch location, what's coming from the catcher. This is kind of the view you're looking at if you're a center fielder right now. You're shading a little bit into left center field. You know, we were talking earlier earlier about this lineup kind of not really not getting going for the Brewers. But I tell you what, I was I was saying before, Hitty's contagious. You know, Arcia comes up with a double, Urias comes up with a double, Taylor comes up with a double. It's just the way it goes in that lineup, and that's I think you know they're looking for that jump start, get a few guys going, and just start putting some putting some runs on the board. There's a strike to Nottingham. No, just missed off the plate. Trying to mix in the changeup right there. 1 0 changeup. This is one of those innings if you're Matthew Boyd, you're trying to find out whatever you could do to minimize the damage, as Sean touched on. Back to back to back doubles by the Brooker. And fortunately for Boyd, Urias tried to steal third base, or there would be nobody out, and it would really be an ugly inning. That's not that bad of a walk with a base open right there, Sean. You do set yourself up for the double play, not that. You know, obviously, Sal Garcia is a guy that's going to hit a lot of ground balls, but if you're, that's not a bad walk. For in depth perspectives on the game, don't forget to check out YouTube's live game commentary featuring MLB, the Brewers, the Tigers accounts in there, and a select group of YouTube creators. They're going to add to our thoughts, share during the broadcast. We'll go deeper, providing YouTube viewers with a unique viewing experience. And you can view that live game commentary on your mobile phone, computer, and also in the living room on your smart TV. We'll be keeping an eye on the discussion throughout the broadcast. And actually, we saw an exchange going on in the live chat 
between the MLB account and the Detroit Tigers talking about the success of Matt Boyd. And that pitch is socked oh, to left. Another one. Another one similar spot. Abasail Garcia connects. And the Brewers have another. Wow, they're peppering that left that left field corner. Another pitch right there, Danny. Looking like a rolling slider curveball that Avicel was able to stay on plane, just get it out front and drive and run. Boy, man, this has been a struggle this second inning so far for Matt Boyd. Not able to get the ball down in the zone. Was stressed a little bit in that first inning. A couple of walks, and he his control had been really good the last three or four starts. He's having a difficult time getting the ball up in the zone. He throws good. He throws hard, Sean. But at 92-93, he, he can't continually pitch near that belt-high waistline fastball area unless he's getting that changeup or that breaking ball down and in below the hitting zone. A walk and four doubles. The latest coming from Garcia and driving in two more. It's 3-0 Milwaukee. A free pass for Keston here in the first. Crawls in again for at bat number two of the day and sends it to third. Nice diving stop by Paredes and his throw is in time. Wow. Well, when you're struggling like Matt, your boy is right now. You need some help from your friends at third base, and that was a terrific play. If you're Keston here, you have to think you're really snake bit. He hits his ball right on the screws. Paredes a terrific comes up. play, wow. right? And sure. Not only to get it, but a nice strong throw across the diamond. Nice play by Candelaria to go out there and get it. Good stretch, and it's a bang bang play, but Hera out by about a half a step. One in scoring position for Christian Yelich. And there's a strike. The exchange, though, on the live chat, the Tigers saying, interested to watch how Boyd uses his different pitches today. He's turned around his season the last few starts, mixing in the changeup more. MLB said, yeah, we're going to get a good start out of Matt Boyd. And then, of course, replied right afterwards, saying, I think I jinxed it. Three runs in for Milwaukee in the second. One thing to keep in mind, though, Matt Boyd gave up a couple runs in his last start, 45 pitches through two. And then he was in absolute cruise control from innings three through six. And it was a short game, a seven inning doubleheader, only featured six innings on the Detroit side. So he has shown the ability to bounce back in his outings. Another poor swing there by Yelich on the breaking ball. If I'm Matt Boyd right now, I think I'd continue to go to that breaking ball down and away. Yelich has had a difficult time. It looks like the fastball, he's off timing. And the couple of breaking balls that we've seen, he's taken some bad swings, Sean. Yeah. You know, you, yeah, when Yelich is going really well, especially lefty on lefty, he opens up that left center gap, right? And when I see him taking the swings that he's taken on that slider uh, away, curveball away, you know, he's really kind of been out front flying that front shoulder. So, you know, it says to me a little bit, he is a little bit in between. I almost feel like the Christian Yelich that's the MVP of the league commits to a ball out over the plate with a lefty and really covers that slider. 2-2 on its way. And he rolls over to the right side. That's why they've been shifting him over there. And in a normal season for Christian Yelich, you probably walk him with first base open, but it's a ground ball out. And Matt Boyd gives up three runs, four doubles for Milwaukee in the seventh, or in the second. They're up 3 nothing. Ron Gardner, you want to try and get these guys as far as you can get them before you get another fish. Oh, boy. Reyes drills one to deep right center field. That ball is gone. That's a massive blast for Victor Reyes. A two-run bomb. There's the add-on runs you wanted. It's 6-0 Tigers. And the 0-2 goes the other way. Ah, another base hit for Victor Reyes. The hitting machine just keeps on churning. He drives in two more and has a stand-up two-run double here in the eighth. Tigers have opened up a seven-run lead. Not only has he become a, an everyday player for the Tigers, he's become a very important staple in this line. Drives one to deep right, hooking, and that ball's gone. 
Victor Reyes starts the Saturday night out with a bang, his fourth homer of the season. One nothing Tigers. Spinner. It's real slow. Look at his leg kick. How slow it is. That's why you get the quick hands. Tigers up one nothing. Four, five, and six do up for the Tigers in the home second. A three spot for Milwaukee off of Matt Boyd in the top of the frame. Thanks to four doubles, all of them to left fields. And now back to work after a long rest for Corbin Burns between the first and the second. He struck out two out of three faced. Three up, three down, back in the opening frame. Well, you talk, you hear a lot of pitchers and pitching coaches talking about a shutdown inning. Brewers able to get three runs across there in the top half of the third. Going through the meat of the order, Candelaria, Castro, and Bonifacio, do you'd like to see Burns be aggressive and get strike one? It's Jamer Candelario squaring a bunt and pulling back. D Danny, what's the mentality here as a starter? You know, you get three, you get three runs, and you know, what are you thinking about coming back, coming back right here? You know, trying to put up a donut. Uh, the key is be aggressive. He, he's throwing the ball really well. A couple of strikeouts in the first inning. Fastball is good. He's throwing the ball on both sides of the plate. There's that hard cutter. You can see why now we had a chance to talk to Craig Council before the game and he was just glowing on how much strides for the better Burns has made this year. Last year he was really strong to his glove side away to righties and into lefties and so far so good he's moved the ball on both sides of the plate. Most pitchers are one sided with the exception of guys like Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin. Most pitchers like most hitters they like the ball either in or they like it out and pitchers are either one side or the other glove side or the arm side. And it's more common to have guys to be strong on their glove side so for Burns it would be much more comfortable for him to throw the ball in towards a lefty like that pitch right there. He could make that pitch in his sleep and a good job getting over pulled to Jerko. And he tosses to Corbin Burns for out number one. The MLB game of the week live on YouTube interactive poll feature allows all viewers to offer a multiple choice response to questions posed in the chat box. Stay tuned as the results will be revealed and discussed later in the show. We want you to all get involved. The poll is going to be posted on your computer screen or your mobile devices right in front of you right now. So chime in. Ready? The first poll of the day, which team in the hunt has the best chance to reach the postseason? Brewers, Tigers, Rockies, Orioles. The Baltimore oh. Orioles are an interesting mix right now. You know, the Yankees, they find themselves at 500. This Orioles team, they can score some runs. They've gotten some really good pitching from their young pitchers the last couple of days. They're hitting home runs. And the Yankees are banged up. The Yankees bullpen hasn't been very good. Don't sleep on the Baltimore Orioles. Making a case of being one of those wild card teams in the American League. That's what's crazy about this two month sprint. You know, here we are talking about the Orioles, talking about the Tigers that are right the there. The Marlins are in the mix yeah, of the, the National League. Yeah, the Marlins are in the mix. You know, I I really like this Tigers team. I think they really got a shot to make a run in these next 20 games or so and uh, get to get into that postseason. We just showed the wild card in the American League. Detroit is one game back as the Yankees fall again yesterday to the Blue Jays. Jay Happ was really good last night for the Yankees. The Yankees having a difficult time scoring runs. Not having Judge and Stanton in that lineup. LeMahieu's back, but I'm not sure he's 100% healthy. Aaron Hicks has struggled. Really, Luke Voigt has been the only positive offensive player in a yeah. season that's been a down year for the Yankees. Luke Voigt said after the game last night hey listen the reality is right now nobody fears the Yankees right now. And that's that's the truth. I mean, the Blue Jays putting that 10 run sixth inning on them the other night you know kind of sent a message that they're for real.
Shift is on the right side for Willie Castro, the 23-year-old. He's been a spark plug the past couple weeks. Burns rings him up. Boy, that's nasty right there. That's something that he wasn't able to do last year. Get the ball away to a lefty. Something to his arm side. Terrific pitch, three and two. I thought the two-two pitch was a good pitch. Danny, is this a cutter? This looks like a cutter. It almost looks like a Watch. backdoor cutter. It is. That is it. And that's uh, that's an unhittable pitch, guys. That's a pitch that John Smoltz mastered yes. these days with the Atlanta Braves to left-handers. He threw so hard and he could throw that backdoor cutter. It was nearly impossible. You give up on it as you, a left-handed hitter. You give up on it. You know, you you think it's outside and then all of a sudden it darts at the last second. It's just tip your cap sometimes. What does it feel like to visual to view that when you're in the battery? It feels box? helpless. <laughs> you feel like you're alone on an island. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're like, oh, that's outside, and then wham! It's almost an unhittable pitch. It just cuts at the last second. It's just you can't even put wood on it. Two outs for Jorge Bonifacio. Dan, it looks to me too like Burns is really throwing his pitches with conviction. Sean, I was just about to say that his body language is terrific. You see right now, he looks his calm demeanor. You don't see a lot of sweat. He doesn't look like he's, you know, nervous grabbing his back of his cap. Very decisive in what he wants to do. And wow. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, Mr. Bonifacio. This year, Corbin Burns is in attack mode. All his pitches working. He is on a mission. The Brewers want him in that rotation for years to come. Look at him go. It's 3-0 Milwaukee after two. When was the first time that you had the inkling that you should be a manager? Well, I think it probably started at a young age when people saw my swing. And what's your, I guess, vehicle of choice? Snowmobile or motorcycle? I know you ride both. Oh, I, I do ride both, and you know, that's kind of a time of year thing, but I really do love the Harley. I got a question actually from one of your, your boys, Daniel Norris. Chuck. Yeah. Okay. And uh, his question was, um, which is more embarrassing, Harry and Lloyd riding on a scooter or riding a tricycle? <laughs> okay. Listen here. You really do want to pitch, Daniel, don't you? Did you coach your son? Uh, never, never. Well, actually, in spring training, he was invited to spring training. Is it predetermined when you're getting tossed? Not all the time. Sometimes, especially if you give up six runs in the first three innings. Four, five, and six coming up for Milwaukee in the third, going up against Matt Boyd. And joining us right now, live on YouTube, is all-star Brandon Woodruff of the Milwaukee Brewers. Brandon, Brandon, how are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Awesome. Doing pretty good. Say hello to Orlando for us as well. Orlando, what's up, man? <laughs> here, here. Center Phil. What's he asking you, Brandon? Right here. He's asking which uh, which camera we're looking at. <laughs> Either the center tight, of the one right here in my face. The tight single <laughs> shot for him. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to remind everyone in the live yep. chat to give us some questions for Brandon as we work through the third inning. Matt Boyd going up against Jed Jerko right now. And I'd like to first start things off with saying a congratulations. I know it's been a hectic few weeks. Your wife, Joni, giving birth yeah. to yeah. Tyler on August 31st. Yeah. Now you're back here in action. How's the newborn doing? Oh man, she's doing great. Um, Joni's not sleeping much, but um, yeah, everything's been good, and uh, so she's she's taking care of everything at home, and um, which makes it a little bit easier to kind of um, you know focus in on on things on the field. Have you uh, gotten up at, at, at all, changing any diapers? Maybe late night, no late 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 night changes. Oh, uh, oh yeah, I, I had a little rude awakening for me the first couple nights in the hospital. Um, <laughs> There's there's no babies on my side of the family, so I've got a, a lot of learning to do and um, but it's good. It's good fun. Uh Oh, go Jed Jerko going the oh, other way. Jetty, Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Jed Jerko uh, muscles up for his sixth home run of the season, <laughs> and the Brewers are up 4 0. Great swing up, by man? Jerko right there. Ball was out over the back. That's, having a tough, a combo. that's a tough ball to get up, get, get on top oh, yeah. of. And Jerko does a great job of letting the ball travel, staying up on it, and able to drive it to right field. He's, he's been killing righties this year. So, never comes off the fastball. Jed Jerko. A lot of activity hey, there in the dugout. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give him a good, good high five here. Oh, yeah, let's, let's catch that. <laughs> Come on, Jetty G. Come on, Jetty G. He's not going to make his way down here, so. <laughs> Air high five. That's what we Good do in swing, 2020. Hey, Good Brandon, swing. I got a question for That's you, right. man. I've, I've been waiting to ask you this yeah. because talk about okay. hunting, the, hunting the fastball. Obviously, we know you're awesome on the yeah. mound, but I don't really want to talk about that. <laughs> I want to talk about the postseason bomb you hit a couple years ago. Uh, was that against Cl Kershaw, too? Oh. Uh, yeah, Come yeah, on. Some... You, you can swing it, bro. You got to. Some... Do you like swinging a stick? I love it. Um, <laughs> it's and it's not a thing that I mean, I grew up hitting. So um, that was kind of my first first thing. The pitching kind of came later. Um, and I'm just not uncomfortable in the box, I guess. So um, I enjoy getting in there and hitting and trying to make the pitcher work. And um, hey, I got lucky on one swing and, and uh, it was a pretty, pretty cool moment. Hey Brandon, I was fortunate to pitch for 18 years. I only had one hit. Let me tell you something. <laughs> if I if I would have hit a bomb off of Clayton Kershaw, it would have taken me a half hour to get around the pillows. <laughs> oh my, oh my gosh. Well, I can tell you what. It probably felt like a half hour because I blacked out as soon as I hit first base. So I don't remember running around any of the bases. <laughs> I had to go back and watch the video to remember what was going on. <laughs> Great. It's kind of nice when somebody's yeah. asking, hey, have you ever hit a home run in the big leagues before? And you say, yeah, who'd you hit it off of? And you tell them Clayton Kershaw, they go, whoa. Well, I, <laughs> funny story about that, our, our third base coach, Ed Cedar, we were in the clubhouse. This was a couple weeks ago. It might have been in summer camp. And he goes, uh, you know, how many of you hitters, you know, have a home run off Kershaw? And, you know, a few guys raise their hand and, and – um, then he goes, how many of you, you know, got one in the postseason off Kershaw? And I'm sitting over there, you know, kind of by myself, and I just, you know, slowly raise the hand up and right here, and everybody else has their hands down. And it was pretty funny. So um, I was definitely fortunate, you know, to put a good swing on it. And then every time I faced Clayton since, I've had zero chance, but I had chance on, on one pitch. So uh, it was pretty cool. Ryan Braun drops one in center field and another knock for Milwaukee. They are on a roll the past couple innings. Four doubles in the second, now a homer and a single to start off the third. And this was the blast for Jerko well above the zone. Well, that's the pitch I'm talking about. Up and away above the zone. Jerko does a great job kind of staying above the baseball, keeping his hands level and really driving down through it. And he's able to create some great backspin to get that ball out to right. Nine of 14 Brewers have reached base so far today. Brandon, I'll mix in some questions for you from the okay. YouTube creators as well. And actually, we'll just double down on the hitting conversation to finish that up because okay. many asking, including yeah. Healy Six, has it been pitching in games <laughs> this year, knowing you don't get to hit. And I think the component, uh, the last sliver here of the conversation is, did you get fired up when you would be at the plate and have a knock and then get back on the mound? Um, that's 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 tough. Um, anytime you get on the base and especially have to run the bases and um, you know come back in, even though you get a little extra time, you gotta you gotta really settle down and just take you know the, enough time necessary to get back out on the mound because your real job is to to get out there and and, and get outs and put up zeros. So um, yeah, that that's tough to do, especially if you're having to go first to third or first to home or trying to score any time and it's a it's a long sprint. You, you got to make sure to take your time before you get back out. And um, so you're able to go out and make some pitches. And um, it's yeah, that, that, that's the toughest part is is running and then trying to get back and uh, get that heart rate down a little bit and go back out and pitch. A ball and two strikes to Orlando Arcia. Here's one from made the cut. Brandon, what's the preferred pitch to punch someone out on an elevated fastball in the upper 90s or low and away wipeout slider? Oh, that's easy. That's that's the uh, it's the hot cheese. Um, that's kind of I've kind of learned over the past few years of uh, RCA to, to use that. And he's 
doubled up. Go ahead, Brandon. How to use that high fastball and, and, and what a weapon it can be if um, if you set it up right. And um, especially nowadays, hitters hitters trying to lift the ball and, and uh, get the ball out of the ballpark. If you can get above that swing, um, you know, it can it can play up for sure. Hey, Brandon, what's been the toughest thing with this uh, summer camp 2.0 and the 60 game schedule? Yeah. What's been the toughest part? Of um, it? I think I think um, I, I think you've kind of seen around the league. You've seen some guys who um, may not be performing, you know, to the best of their abilities. And and and, and the thing with this year is we don't have the luxury of of uh, get out of play. We don't have the luxury of the 162. And um, I think that's kind of been one of the toughest things to navigate. And um, but. And, and stay mentally strong in that aspect of it is as far as you know staying with the right process and the right um, putting in the right work in between and and um, just knowing you know if, if things will eventually turn around but with you know 60 games uh, you know coming up to a close here it's it's tough that's that's probably been the the hardest thing to navigate if you get up to a slow start in a regular season you've got that time to um, I guess you know finish strong and, and, and have those extra starts or whatever it may be as far as the hitter you've got the five six hundred at bat so um, that's been a, one of the toughest things. Well we know this team has magic in September and there's Arias grounding out so perfect timing here Brandon we appreciate everything yep. the players are doing this year it. providing a great escape and thanks for joining us live on YouTube. Of course. Thank keep, you guys. Keep hitting bombs too. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Swing hard in case you hit it. <laughs> That's what Jed Jerko did. It's four nothing Brewers. That's right. What Jetty J. <laughs>
you know, what was that like for you, uh, really kind of getting your, your emotions under control? Yeah, um, it was it was very exciting. I mean, uh, I mean, I, it didn't really matter who was in the box. I mean, I was just out there just having a blast. Um, but they're obviously a very good lineup and a very good team. So um, it was definitely a challenge, but uh, I had a really good time and, um, you know, competed my tail off. And um, unfortunately, we lost the game. But, um, you know, like I said, they're a very good team. And um, it, it was it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed myself. I really did. Casey, your signature off-speed pitch is the split finger. Was that a pitch that you had at Auburn? Is that where you learned the split finger? Uh, I picked it up a little bit in high school, um, but Coach Butch Thompson at Auburn changed my grip of it in college. Um, and, you know, that's after I did that, that's when it really took off. Hey, Casey, I hear you're superstitious. At least a couple rituals for each start. Can you run through them for us? Uh, I, I'm not very superstitious. I mean, I'm very routine oriented. Um, you know, I really have a plan that written out in, you know, a journal that I keep of everything that I try to do. Um, but it's, it's basically for um, mental preparation and physical preparation. But I'm not superstitious, honestly, whatsoever. I'm just, you know, I, I believe in work and uh, I believe in routines. And, um, you know, I try to accomplish that, you know, every day. A source told me two things. One, a clean shave for each start and also a banana as you're walking from the bullpen to the mound. Was he accurate? Uh, I, yeah, I do clean shave. Uh, I don't know if that's superstition. I just, I just like to, you know, feel uh, clean and, and ready to go to work. Um, banana. I, I haven't done. I've done that once uh, up in the big leagues. Um, I haven't really done that, uh, you know, since college. But uh, I just like bananas. So <laughs> great if, nutritional if around, value. I, I Potassium. Potassium. Yeah. <laughs> Here's Isak Paredes, who takes the pitch in tight. How fun has it been for you to get the call, Paredes? We've seen Tarek Skubal, four of the top seven prospects are up with the Tigers right now, all together in a playoff race. Yeah, it's awesome. It's guys that I played with last year uh, in Double A Erie, um, and it's, it's cool. I mean, we, we just spent a lot of time together in the minor leagues, and, and now we're up here, and you know, trying to help this team win games. And so it, it's really awesome. Um, especially, it's, it's awesome to see Daz today out there. You know, it's. Um, I know he's been working really hard to get here, so it's, it's just it's special for all of us, and, and it, it's really cool that we're all up here together and uh, trying to help this club win ball games. We're showing the first round picks for the Tigers in the past three drafts. Casey talking to us now. Riley Green, exciting young player. Back in 2019, he was drafted fifth overall, and this past year's draft in June, Spencer Torkelson going number one overall, coming out of Arizona State. The man can swing the bat. We'll see him in the big league soon enough as it's now a full count to Isak Paredes. And we'll mix in one question here. Uh, Giraffe Neck Mark says, what's the biggest adjustment you've had to make from college ball to pro ball? Um, there, there wasn't really, um, you know, a ton difference. Um, for me, it was a facilities adjustment. You know, you go from really nice facilities and a big fan base and, um, you know, just really electric atmospheres in the SEC, and then you go play minor league baseball. and. Um, you don't really get that again, and so it's it's going from really gr great things all the time to not so great, and so that that was a big adjustment at the time. But now you're back to greatness. Yeah, nice facilities yeah, and all that right, in the big leagues. Right. Casey, thank you so much for the time. Good luck the rest of the season. Okay. Thanks, Case. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. It's Casey Mai talking about his experiences at Auburn. Now in the big leagues, it's four nothing Brewers after three. Go. Sends one to right. Go. And that's going to drop. And that will skip by the rookie. Reyes will score. Scope's got a chance for three. And he will head into third with an RBI triple. The job of two is evident by his long blocks. Here's the one two to Gamble. Sprays it to left. Stewart surrounds it. Gamble's going to test him. Head to second. The throw in time. And the tag is made. My way isn't always the best way. I got it. Demerit strokes one to left. That was on a rope. They're going to wave Bonifacio home. Rosario's got a good arm and touch the base. He dropped the ball, and they call him safe at home plate. All right, let's see if we can see it from here. He goes under it. Yeah, I think sure he, he did. did. Yeah. Yep. They upheld the call, and the Tigers have the one nothing lead. Very important staple. Drives one to deep right, hooking, and that ball's gone. Victor Reyes starts the Saturday night out. 
with a bang, his fourth homer of the season, one nothing Tigers. Four runs from the Brewers and three perfect innings from their starters so far this afternoon. And let's reveal the poll results. Best chance to make the postseason. The Brewers checking in at 38% from everyone chiming in on YouTube. And then Tigers at 24, Rockies 22, Orioles at 16. And if we go by fan graphs, playoff projections out of those four teams, they are giving Milwaukee the best shot. They are two and a half games away from second place, which is a spot in the in the playoffs this year in the division at St. Louis ahead of them. They're also two and a half back of a wild card position. So a number of ways to make it to October. Eight, nine and one coming for the Brewers. This is Tyrone Taylor who doubled back in the second part of a four double inning for Milwaukee. They put up three runs in the second and add a Jed Jerko home run in the third. And I think what makes Brewers fans optimistic for once their starting pitching has held up their end of the bargain. Burns has been terrific this afternoon. Brandon Woodruff is their ace and Adrian Hauser has thrown the ball well so they feel like they run three pretty good starting pitchers out here at you with pretty good stuff. Bullpen with Josh Hader has been terrific. Little cue shot that's going to be a tough play and it is an infield knock for Tyrone Taylor. Let's swing it to J.P. Morosi, who is at the ballpark in Detroit. Scott, good afternoon. A little before the game today, a beautiful moment right around home plate. Two players wearing jerseys with the number 21 in honor of Roberto Clemente. Two of Clemente's Puerto Rican countrymen, Alex Claudio of the Brewers and Joe Jimenez of the Tigers. You could just see them in conversation there and embrace Scott. This game means so much to everyone, but certainly those two gentlemen above probably everyone else at Comerica Park here today. Thanks JP. Jacob Nottingham fouling the first pitch back. MLB is allowing all Puerto Rican players to wear the number 21 today. That includes Willie Castro as well. All of the Pirates players and personnel wearing 21. Gadi Molina spoke about the fact that there is so much pride and honor in wearing that number today and he said Clemente is the source of inspiration. We need to move forward and pursue our dreams and be an example to others on and off the field. I know someone that wore 21 for the Tigers. He's sitting six feet away from me Sean Casey. That's right. I mean I, I wore 21 for the Tigers. I'm from Pittsburgh and I know what 21 means to so many so many uh, players. Uh, so many people in Pittsburgh and Puerto Rico in the Latin community, you know, there's there's talks right now, uh, you know, of, of, of retiring 21. That's how much Clemente meant. You know, we talk about Jackie Robinson in 42 and then you talk about Clemente in 21. That that number means a lot uh, to a lot of people in the game of baseball. And uh, it's just it was wonderful to see, you know, uh, you know, guys wearing 21 because maybe one day it'll be retired. Nottingham lifts that one deep to left and Bonifacio will give it a look. He has no play. It's gone. Jacob Nottingham powers up for two and Milwaukee's up six zip. Well the home run has cost Matt Boyd. We touched on it coming into this start. 50 home runs he's allowed since the beginning of the 2019 season. Brew crew playing some long ball. Second home run they've hit on the day. Getting some separation as well as Corbin Burns has been pitching another pitch up in the zone. Looks like a changeup. Kind of dives back to the inner third of the plate. Bonifacio gives it a good go all the way back to the wall. Almost looked like a batting practice swing. You know, it was a pitch down the middle, changeup, maybe like, you know, a little something off it. And his swing uh, when Nottingham really getting through that baseball almost looked like a batting practice fastball right there. Just an easy swing yeah. with loft to it. Yeah, just like a nice fly ball. Something you hit in BP. Third career home run for the Brewers catcher. And back to the top of the order, and Abisail Garcia. So that's eight hits from this Milwaukee offense. Two home runs. 
and four doubles. You know, we touched on the Tigers have been kind of a surprise team at two games under 500 starting the year. But one thing jumps out at you, Scott, you look at the worst pitching ERAs in the game. The Red Sox have the worst going into today's play at little over six at 6.39. Tigers ERA going into play today, 6.19, and that needle is moving north. Six runs through four, three innings so far for Matthew Boyd. And speaking of which, the last two seasons, you look at his numbers through August 3rd of last season, ERA was below four big time strikeout numbers and the home run rate spiked this season, second most in the American League, 11 of them, that's entering today, now up to 13 home runs allowed on the year. Garcia doubled last time up, and this time a free pass. Boyd was the opening day starter for Detroit. This was the player they were hoping to rely on, a veteran member of the staff. And the highest DRAs this season, the Tigers second behind Boston. Spencer Turnbull, who pitched yesterday, has been the shining star in the rotation so far. And that's going to do it for Matt Boyd. Did not have it this afternoon. John Schreiber will replace him out of the bullpen. After back to back quality starts against a dynamic Twins offense, Matt Boyd held in check today by the Milwaukee Brewers. They attack for six runs. And let's take a look back on this date in 1992 in front of nearly 48,000 fans at Milwaukee County Stadium, a Brewer legend took another step toward baseball immortality. Oftentimes, I dream of being a major league player. I was lucky. That dream came true. Here's a drive to deep left. Got a chance to go. Robin, go! A home run. I would dream of hitting a home run in the World Series. He's got his fourth hit home run. For playing in an all-star game. I was lucky. Those dreams came true. I was lucky enough to be drafted by the Milwaukee Brewers, a fairly new organization at the time, trying to establish itself in the American League. Home run for Robin Yon, lifted to the off-field. Extraordinary power for a shortstop. A prolific hitter, he produced 3,142 hits. Swings, and here it is! A base hit in the right center. He's done it. 3,000 for Robin. On behalf of myself and the fans of Milwaukee and Wisconsin, it has been an unbelievable privilege. Back in action with John Schreiber taking over for Matt Boyd. And the first pitch misses in to Keston Hira. Dan, what, like was, what was it like? Was I was it? at that game. Were you really? Member of the Brewers. That was my last year. Wearing a Brewers uniform in 92. Robin Young was the epitome of what you would think a baseball player would be. Not a lot of razzmatazz. Uh, I remember first spring training show in 1986. Walked into that clubhouse, that home clubhouse was Robin Young, Paul Molitor, Cecil Cooper, Ben Ogilvy, Raleigh Fingers, wow. Pete Ladd. It was a very intimidating place to be, and there he is, Rocket Robin, one of the best ever. MVP as a shortstop and as a center fielder. Could do it all. Steady. 1999 inducted into the Hall of Fame. Two MVPs, the franchise leader in a number of categories. And that pitch hit Keston Hira. So on to first base he goes. And Garcia will move his way up as well. Danny, what was he like as, you know, because I you know, played with a lot of great players, a lot of, lot of Hall of Fame players. What was Robin Yao like in that clubhouse? Real quiet guy. Uh, you really wouldn't know he was there when he walked into the clubhouse. 
another pitcher. This is a backdoor breaking ball. Hits him right in the wallet. If you're going to get hit, that's where you <laughs> wanted to get hit. You, you know the funny thing about Robin Yount? He would come into spring training, and he was loved to play golf and ride motorcycles in the offseason. And he would come into camp, and usually the first three or four games in the Cactus League would be an 0 for 3 and 0 for 4. And, and all of a sudden, it was like Sean about game 7 or game 8. He hit a line drive to right field. You're like, okay, he's ready. <laughs> and one line drive turned into a boatload of others. A terrific player. Christian Yelich in the air to left. And there is out number one of the fourth. 1992, my last year in Milwaukee, Sean. My rookie year in 1986, we were the swing team. That's when the Brewers were in the American League. And we were ended our season against the AL West teams. And one of the greatest lessons learned came from Robin Yount. We ended a series in Toronto playing the Blue Jays and he had turf toe really bad. I walked into the clubhouse after the game and we're getting ready to leave and he was on the trainer's table getting an injection of cortisone for turf toe. And I remember walking in and looking at that thinking oh that has to be painful. So we fly across country and we're Friday night we're playing the A's in Oakland. And I walked up to him and I said hey I'm just curious I saw I saw you're in the lineup today. And he said why wouldn't I be. <laughs> and I just said ah, I, I don't know I just like. You had a needle last time I saw you had a needle sticking out of your toe. And he said, let me ask you something. Did you ever fake like you were sick when your mom and dad so you didn't have to go to school and they left to go to work and you were home and you laughed all day and you thought you pulled one over. I said, yeah, we've all done that. He said, that's how it is in baseball when you take a day off. When you find out how easy it is, you'll keep doing it over and over again. And he said it stone faced. And from that day on, Sean, I was never taking a day off. <laughs> If I was breathing, I was pitching. <laughs> Lesson learned in 1986. <laughs> That's so great. Schreiber straightens up Jerko. And there are two outs. Hey, and that's why now Dan Plesak. Yeah, rough day, at off, rough day at the office in inning two. Big three run inning for the Brewers. Stack See every, everything up Google in the zone, Cloud. Scott. Uh, that's been one of the issues. All over the place, too. And this is mainly towards the left field so balls up in the zone Brewers in full happy mood this afternoon you take a look at Matt Boyd right there that's one of those games where he had had a couple in a row you see him talking to himself in that towel Ryan Braun pass shortstop and that is going to be a play oh, at the plate the 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 and did he ever touch home yeah he's in there he's safe Avisel Garcia scores with a smile and Ryan Braun drives in the seventh run for Milwaukee I thought for sure they were going to have. I'd like to see this slide. Throw was there in time. This is what we're talking about, guys. Hit his, hit his contagious. Braun comes up, gets a hit. What's happened here? Oh, the ball kind of gets stuck. It looks like in his arm. He never is able to get the tag. Great slide right there by Garcia. Look at Griner holding on to the baseball even though it wasn't in the glove. Kind of <laughs> trapped it with his body and held it with his <laughs> armpit or something. I'd say he did it. And, and, and then the fake tag right here where you, and then you tell the umpire, look, he's out. He's dead. It's, 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 it's trapped in his arm. I got him with my hand. Yeah, so good. This has been a sleepy offense. We saw that yesterday up until the ninth inning. Not today. The missing link for Milwaukee has been the bats. The Brewers season high for runs is only nine. They've had 13 base runners already today. Detroit's had zero. Did RC go? He sure did. Schreiber picks up another strikeout. And that will do it for the Brewers in the fourth. They had three more runs. And Milwaukee, thanks to a home run from Nottingham and an RBI single from Ryan Braun, putting up seven so far, close to that season high of nine. Nottingham with the big blast in the fourth. You got a real attitude problem, Hero. 
You're a slacker. Reminds me of an infielder who used to play here. I coached him in college. He was a slacker too. Can I go now, Murph? Wait a minute, Suter, you're telling me you made a time machine out of the bullpen car? 88. 88 miles per hour? 88 miles per hour, what did I tell you? Here's how it works. First, you turn the time circuits off. This readout tells you where you're going. This one tells you where you are. This one tells you where you were. You enter the input destination time onto this keypad, okay? Say you want to see something from the first 50 years of Brewers history, like your major league debut, Nigel Morgan's walk-off, Robin Yao's 3,000 pit, Harvey's wall bangers. This, this is what makes time travel possible, the flux capacitor. Flux capacitor? A Brewer dream so far today. Seven runs, the offense on fire, and Corbin Burns has sat down the side in each of his first three innings in order. And joining us now, the manager of Milwaukee, Craig Council, for this half. Hey, Craig, thanks so much for the time. And, well, let's start with Corbin Burns, because the last few starts, he has been absolutely electric. And what's been so impressive about him? Yeah, he, he's been really good so far today. I think that the cutter has been a really good pitch for him um, and, and he's also thrown some good sliders to the righties. So he's got um, a lot working today and you, and you can tell by uh, the at bat so far. Counts, I, you know what, I, I, I look at this lineup and I, it does baffle me with the guys, you know, so many guys hitting around 200 with the big names in that lineup. But I feel like, you know, you know and I know in this game, you know, hitting is so contagious and it seems like that's what's happening today. Are you kind of waiting for this this club to just start rolling together? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. We, we feel like we just haven't you know, li lived up to our potential offensively. And then, you know, you, you know that it's going to come and you know it's going to balance out. But you, you start to worry, is there enough season for it to get there? And so that's where we're at. And so hopefully, you know, a day like today is a good sign. A um, couple guys swinging the bat really good. Um, Brawny with a couple hits, just getting him going is a big deal. Um, getting Avi going is a big deal for us. So good signs today. Craig, you've had two guys in your bullpen. Josh Hader gets a lot of attention. Tell us a little bit about Devin Williams. Well, Devin's had a, just a brilliant year. I mean, I, I would challenge anybody who says he's not the best reliever so far in baseball. He's and he's got a pitch, a changeup that is um, it's just dynamite. It's it's a little bit different than than changeups of the past that we've seen. It's it's almost like a screwball. It kind of acts like a screwball a little bit. It's movement. Um, and it's and it's gotten to the point where, you know, hitters have started to look for it as, as he's had success with it. And we still haven't seen good swings on it. And we still haven't seen, you know, hard contact on it. That's that's when you start to know you got a really special pitch. Craig, thanks for the time. We'll blink. This inning's probably over. So good luck the rest of the way. Okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate hey, it. Thanks, Counts. It's been like that for the past few innings for Corbin Burns. Two strikeouts in the first, two more in the second, added a strikeout in the third, and the punch out of Victor Reyes gives him six so far on the day. Going up against Jonathan Scope, two hitter who struck out in the first. On the ground is short. Taylor made for Arcia. Boy, what a performance so far from Corbin Burns. Throwing strikes, weak contact. Let's mix in another poll question, shall we? For everyone watching, you can all help us out. Which YouTube analyst would finish the mile first? Dan Plesak or Sean Casey? Not just in a race, this isn't a sprint. We're talking about a mile. How, how much time do we have? A day? <laughs> to talk about it or to run it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm going to have to give it to Danny. You know, he's a pitcher. He's got those long legs. He'll probably beat me in the mile. Good thing we both know CPR, right? <laughs> <laughs> we would get to the finish line to be done, right? <laughs> I was late for the meeting, and I won't be networked the other day. I ran like 45 feet. I was like, my knee, my back, my head, my brain. <laughs>
That's the beautiful thing. They don't pay us to run and throw anymore, do they, Sean? Oh, I'm, no. so, I'm so thankful. Yeah. I'm that so boat thankful. has left the dock many moons ago. Exactly. I remember when I first came over to the Tigers, I got there, I got there and, uh, on a trade, and we're in Tampa, and Jimmy Leland grabs me right before the media is talking to me. I need to talk to you, Case. I go in the office. It's Gene Lamont, Lloyd McClendon, and Leland. He says, all right, Case, we're going to give you the signs. And Lamont's like, all right, Case, I'm going to go through the signs. Boom, boom, boom. I go to my ear. It's hot. I go to my belt. It's a bump. We're not going to give you that one, but the, the, the um, we're going to give you the hit and run. And then Leland says, all right, Case, you know what? He goes, don't look at, don't look over there if you get on first base with a walk or a hit. He goes, I don't want you looking at Gino at third. I want you looking into the dugout. He goes, now stay with me. I come up on the top step, and we catch eyes. As soon as we catch eyes, if I jump up and never come back down, you steal. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first conversation with Jim Leland in Detroit. I was like, oh, man, this guy's locked in. He must know I'm slow as molasses. He read the scouting report. Miguel Cabrera shoots one to center. That is deep and playable for Garcia at the track. The beauty of this poll is that it's like a race. We can keep track of the numbers flowing as it goes. So right now, Plesak leads the poll 59 to 41. <laughs> we'll show those results very soon. What? You're a Craig Council. Yeah? And who are you? Suter, I need your help to get back. My goodness! I thought I told you never to come in here. <laughs> Hank has just become the world's first time traveler. You're gonna be a Golden Glover someday. Gold Glover? Lorenzo Kane? Man, I like the sound of that. Suter, we have enough road to get up to 88? Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. We've reached the fifth in Detroit. Milwaukee's up 7-0 as they wrap up a season series between these two teams. Ron Gardenhire managing a Detroit ball club that is in the thick of a playoff race. One game out of a spot as they won six in a row recently, up to 19-21, and 21, a W last night over the Brewers. And Ron Gardenhire is joining us right now live on YouTube here in the fifth as it's Orlando Arcia, Luis Arias, and Tyrone Taylor coming up for Milwaukee. Ron, thanks for the time. And first off, Matt Boyd didn't have it today. What did you see that differed from him in this start versus the previous two? Well, he didn't look like he had much command of any of his pitches and they, you know, the ones that he did throw over, they were jumping at him pretty good. So it's just one of those days. He's a good pitcher, one of our best, if not our best, and just a tough day. They, they got to him and uh, he couldn't get the ball where he wanted to. Hey, Guardy, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Jamer Candelario right in the middle of that lineup. Really, he's been so hot for the last 30 plus games. And, and uh, what do you what have you seen from him so far? Yeah, exactly that. You know, he's kind of found his groove, and uh, you know what? He's seeing the ball really well from both sides. And, uh, you know, this is something we talked about, you know, over the last winter that we really need him to step up and do some things. He was playing a really good third base until we lost our first baseman. So, you know what? Uh, we need him to continue. He's, he's a big part of the lineup right now, driving in runs, and, you know, he's coming out of his shell, I guess you could say. He's uh, becoming a, a real major league player here and, and getting it done. Guardy, what's been the toughest thing about this crazy COVID-19 world of 2020? 
this mask <laughs> for one thing. Uh, it's not, holy cow. I feel like I'm smothering. So uh, it's crazy, you know, wearing this doggone thing, you know, all day long. And uh, and then, you know, no fans. I mean, we're so used to having the fans around here and the loud noises and, you know, it's just so quiet. So uh, it's it's different for sure. Uh, and we're all trying to grind it out. I think every team is and, you know, try to try to figure out a way to get in that playoff format. McCarty there watching today worldwide on YouTube. We miss those fans. Thank you so much for the time. Good luck the rest of this season. It's going to be a wild race. Yeah, you got it. I can't really see you because my glasses are fogging <laughs> over again. So you guys take care. All right. All right. You, you look we'll great, Gardy. Thanks, Gardy. <laughs> Thanks. All right. See you. That is actually one of the most difficult parts of the mask is the glasses fogging right. up. Joe Madden has spoken about that a number of times trying to find some type of fix because he says often it's fogging up and I can't see the pitch. Someone will invent a, invent a mask here soon. There'll be an app for it where you hit a button and it <laughs> unfogs your glasses. A little windshield yeah. on the glasses. <laughs> Arcia going the other way and there is Cameron. Or make that Urias. He flies out to right field. And Tyrone Taylor coming up. You know, if you're the Brewers, there's less than three weeks left in the season. Brewers going into the plate tonight, this afternoon. A couple of games out of that wild card spot. Two and a half games behind the Cubs. It'd be interesting to see. They could get this offense going, Sean. I know they'd like to get Christian Yelich or Ryan Braun going. Taylor's had a good afternoon so far, two for two. Days like today have been far and few in between for the Brew Crew, near the bottom in about every offensive category. And if Sean, if they could somehow pick this tempo up in the next three weeks, they could make some noise here in the Central. Danny, this is how you this is how you get going right here. You, you said it. I mean. Today could be a stepping stone for them to get going. This is such hitting is such a game of confidence, and I really think like if they could just get it going and and, and figure out a way to, to you know to get some momentum. But you see the key losses here, like you were saying, Danny Lorenzo Cain's not just uh, opted out. Mustakis and those guys and Grandall, you know, are gone, and that's that's a lot of thunder in that lineup. But they have enough thunder in this lineup to get hot for these next uh, next few weeks and get into the postseason. You, you know case in point too. you look at the Philadelphia Phillies a couple of weeks ago they were kind of on the outside looking in and they have one stretch where they have a nine and one run. Now all of a sudden they have a shot in the NL East. They're pretty well situated to make a wild card spot. And I think if you're any of the team you're the Tigers or the Brewers you have one ten game run where you go seven and three eight and two all of a sudden you make a lot of hay and the outlook is a lot different from week to week. The Brewers had an 18 and 2 run last year in September, so they're certainly capable of stringing Go. together some W's. That's fouled off by Taylor. JP, what do you think about this Brewers team? Well, Scott, let's think about this. 20 games left, including today, 10 of them against the team they are directly chasing, the St. Louis Cardinals. So to Sean and Dan's points, if you're getting those wins against the team you're chasing, you are certainly moving up in the standings. Well, they're still loose. You could see Arcia having fun with the camera angle. And Taylor flies out to center. This is what JP is talking about. Final 14 days, they play the Cardinals 10 times. Five. And then you see them again with five there on the bottom of the screen, mixed in with the Royals, Reds, and the Cubs plenty of divisional clashes still to go not an easy stretch right there. No. That's a big hack from Jacob Nottingham. Coming off the two run homer in the fourth. He takes some big swings. Nottingham was one of the players in that Chris Davis deal back when, when the when the Brewer when the Brew crew sent Chris David to Oakland Davis to Oakland Nottingham came back in that deal. They had high hopes for him on offense the bat really hasn't come around yet back in his early minor league days they made some Mike Napoli comparisons. Yeah. This is what Nap used to do. Well, that was a nice swing right there just nice and easy got a pitch right out over the plate didn't try to do too much and just skied it for a home run. 
This time down on three pitches. Impressive inning from Schreiber, but Corbin Burns has been stealing the show. He has a perfect game rolling through four. We'll see him in the fifth in a moment. Sitting on a 2-0. On the ground, there it is! His 2,000th career hit as a Tiger, joining that exclusive club, and it brings in Reyes for the first run of the day. He joins Cobb and Kaline, Geringer, Heilman, Crawford, Trammell, and Whitaker. Honestly, it's like every time he gets a hit, we get the ball. We have to get the ball because he just did something else special, and today it was 2,000 hits with the Tigers, and I started looking around thinking the rest of the team doesn't have 2,000 hits. Uh, so it's kind of like, holy cow, this guy's been playing a long time. You have to be able to, you have to do that to have all those hits, but on one team, 2,000 hits, that's amazing. You know, like, like I told him all the time, it's an honor for me to play with him, you know. Miguel is one of the best players, I, no, he's the best player that I play with. Yeah, it's fun, it's fun if you see somebody breaking records and, you know, on the way to the, the Hall of Famer, you know, and. It's an honor for me to just be here and, and, and see and see all the records going to break. He's passing some names that are in the history books in baseball's lore. And uh, that's, that's just incredible for a manager. You get a chance to manage a guy like this, but you get a chance to watch him. This copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. Brewers up big, and the storyline belongs to Corbin Burns. Perfect through four, Dan. Well, 12 up, 12 down, and here's a little package. Backdoor breaking ball. Watch this sequence here. Little front door breaking ball up and in, and he finishes off with a really good one. Craig Council told us before the game if he's throwing the ball to both sides of the plate, he'll be really good, and he's been very, very good. 12 up, 12 down. Hard to be better, Scott, than he's been so far. Sport Gaming Universe in the chat section said, of course, a no-no watch because it's a YouTube game. We always get firsts. Six strikeouts over those four innings. And this is the big number in today's world. What is the pitch count? It's 51. 51. Very manageable pitch count, and if you're Craig Council right now you've got a couple of big pieces in your bullpen that are ready to go. Josh Hader can go multiple innings along with Devin Williams. So if you're a fan of the Brewers right now this one's setting up looking pretty good. Satcast powered by Google Cloud and he strikes these batters out in a variety of ways. You take a look at that, you see the kind of the, the pinkish purple and the yellow. Both sides of the plate, and that's one of the keys. Last year and the year before, he was more one-sided. To his glove side, he was really strong throwing strikes. Had a difficult time getting the ball away to lefties and into righties. He seems to have fixed that, and he has turned himself into a terrific pitcher. He has thrown the ball really well for Milwaukee right now. You figure that's the number. We showed you a career high 94 pitches last year in April against the Dodgers. This year's season high was 93. So you figure if he has that special stuff going deeper into the game, you would cap him off at about what, 110 pitches? 1-5, one 1-10, one depending on how he looks. You know, that's from Craig Council in the pitch. That's a terrific. That's a terrific pitch. You get a 3-1 and he throws that hard sinking fastball. If you're Candelario, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to look for a fastball. And Sean, I think one of the things you have to do today in baseball is velocity plays. But you look at Jacob DeGrom and Garrett Cole. Watch the sequence. This ball is in the zone, and it's down out of the zone. If you could have two types of fastballs, a sinking fastball like that one, and then that one you can ride up in the zone, and that's the difference maker. Where you have a fastball, but you have two different fastballs, Sean, it's like having two different pitches. The fact that Danny, you're exactly right. The fact that he can crisscross the plate with his, with his, uh, with his cutter and his sinker. I mean, I think for me that, that that's an equalizer. If I have to respect both sides of the plate as a hitter, now you can get my head spinning. And uh, you know, when I'm watching Burns today, man, this guy is really, 
crisscrossing the plate with that cutter sinker combination and uh, has has made these guys look pretty bad on some bad swings. After the Castro ground out Bonifacio with a big swing and that one going to deep right center and it is high off the wall. First hit of the day for Detroit and Bonifacio is hustling into third with a one out triple. Or Willie Castro, my bad there. Willie Castro with a triple off of Corbin Burns here in the fifth. Well, Willie Castro's really been swinging the bat well. This is a pitch right here that Burns wants back. It's a little two seamer that he fades out over the plate. For a left handed hitter, that's one of the best balls to hit in baseball. If, the, if you don't get the two seamer in, and I can see it out of your plant, out of your hand, and it just leaks out over the plate, it allows me to keep that front shoulder tucked and generate some power. And that's what you saw right there from Willie Castro. Six game hit streak, hitting over 400 during that span. The Candelario bounced out. Castro with the triple with one out. Spoils the perfect game bid and the no no. Two triples on the year for Castro. Bonifacio struck out his first at bat with that hard breaking ball away and Burns started him off with a slider again. This is where you you try not to get greedy with a seven to nothing score. You certainly don't want to give up a run. But the last thing you want to do is put base runners on. You almost trade a run for an out right here. I think you're going to see more steady diet of breaking balls to Bonifacio. The last four pitches that he's seen have been either called strikes or swings and misses on the breaking ball. Burns may elect to go with a fastball high up in the zone and to make him chase or just continue to go with that hard breaker down and away. Did he go? No, he did not. A ball and two strikes to Bonifacio. You know, Castro got Comerica just now. 29 other ballparks. That ball is a home run. I, I've been Comerica before. You, hit, you, you crush one to right center, you're like, oh, yeah, it's gone. And then you're like, no, it's not. And it's not even a double. A lot of times guys just catch it. And you're like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, that's ridiculous. It, that's a tough ballpark to hit in. There's no doubt about it. You hit 298 at Comerica. I saw it yesterday, though. Daniel Vogelbach hit a ball, I believe it was 411 feet to deep central. <laughs> right. Fly ball out. Oh, not even close. That, that's like 10 feet from the wall. I saw, and Miguel Cabrera, for the numbers that he's put up, he has 482 home runs in his career. I, there's no doubt he's lost, I think, at least 60 home runs playing in that park. Bonifacio yeah. goes around frustrated. Nasty cutter right there. Wow. He had seen a serious diet of breaking balls, more sliders, and that was a 93 mile an hour cutter. This is a pitch that he'll use to lefties to try to jam him. This is a tough pitch to hit. Watch this ball. It appears it's going to be in the strike zone a long time, and it has that hard cutting action at 93 miles an hour. Not much Bonifacio could do with that. You're kind of in protect mode with two strikes. Nasty pitch by Burns. Dan, when I was so impressed about that at bat, he stayed out there the whole time on Bonifacio and had enough command to just be down and off the plate, down and off the plate. And then he got the vision going down and off the plate and was able to throw that nasty cutter. That's filthy. Nasty right there. You have a young guy, Daz Cameron, his first at bat. He had a little check swing to the right side, bounced out to first base. You got a young guy. If you're Corbin Burns, you take a great, uh, advantage of a young hitter coming up, being aggressive, hunting the fastball, looking for a fastball. You slow him down. Terrific first pitch breaking ball. He comes back with that another hard cutter at 96 miles an hour. That's that's nearly impossible to hit. Yeah, that's filthy. If you're Plus, Daz Cameron right now, you're thinking, wait a minute, I didn't see this at the <laughs> extended camp. Yeah. This wasn't at the alternate site. <laughs> he was the star of the alternate site. Proud day today, though, from from my man Mike Cameron and his whole family watching Daz get his getting his first uh, big league debut. Oh, Boy, what a nice job there by Nottingham. But you want to see a clinic on knocking a ball down and keeping it in front. Not an easy thing to do. A lot of times that hard breaking ball that's in the dirt will bounce back. He does a great job of watch this getting down on both of his knees Sean and he keeps his ball right in front. This is textbook catch it right off the middle of the chest protector. It's a play that catchers work on in spring training over and over again knocking the ball down and deadening it to keep it in front of you. One two. You know who's breathing a big sigh of relief right now. Juan Nieves. 
caught Nottingham right on the hand right there. Sure did. Ah. One of the dangers and pitfalls of being a catcher. You often hear it in quickest way to the big leagues. Watch this right hand, his right hand, his exposed hand. It's just behind the shin guard. Oh and just such God. a small area to be able to hit that. Oh. So after that, do you make sure the hand is completely behind? Uh, probably, subconsciously. While they check him out. So Juan Nieves, Dan, has the only no hit uh, no hitter in Milwaukee Brewers franchise history, a former teammate of yours. I was warming up for the last out of that game. He had a no hitter. His pitch total was up. Robin Yao, but there's another look at that foul ball off of Nottingham's throwing hand. Fly ball that was hit to the gap in right center field. Robin Yao made a diving catch to save the no hitter. At Old Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. Cold, damp, rainy night in April. And Cameron goes fishing. Whew. Corbin Burns. Wow. Eight strikeouts. The one triple spoils the special bit. He's frustrated about it, but a lot to smile about today. Back in against Mesa, who is working from the windup. The 0 1 pitch. Swings, and there it is! A base hit in the right center. He's done it. 3,000 for Robin. Swing and a drive! Left center and deep! Get out! Get out of here! Get on! To Ryan Braun! And they've got the lead! Wow! What a shot by Braun! It's his 37th of the year! Back at Comerica Park, and today we honor each club's nominee for the Roberto Clemente Award. Voting for the award starts today. Some past winners, our friend John Smoltz, back in 2005, David Ortiz in 2011, Miguel Cabrera and Brent Suter are the nominees for the Tigers and the Brewers, respectively. Clayton Kershaw winning in 2012, Beltron in 2013, an annual recognition of an MLB player who represents the game of baseball through extraordinary character, community involvement, philanthropy, and positive contributions both on and off the field. And with more on that, let's check in with JP. Scott, thank you. For Miguel Cabrera, it was back in the spring. Detroit and Michigan were hit especially hard by the COVID-19 oh. pandemic. Miguel and his wife, Rosangel, made a donation of $250,000 locally to help, especially the Detroit Public Schools, to continue providing meals to children who otherwise might have gone without food during those days back in the spring. Brent Suter with the Brewers, his focus has been truly global, finding ways to recycle old plastic bottles uh, at Miller Park for the Brewers home games in past years to find ways to repurpose them into ways that are environmentally conscious and friendly. Uh, Brent Suter, a graduate of Harvard University, he studied environmental science and public policy there, did Brent Suter. And Brent has talked a lot, Scott, about how the link is there between environmental justice, social justice. He's been at the forefront of so many important conversations around the country and the world this year. Thanks, JP. Also the link between JP and Brent Suter going to the same school. There we go. The Harvard grads. Yeah, Brent does an absolute fantastic job in the community. And he has been talking about his environmental efforts since day one in the big leagues. 
just an excellent representative in this game. Garcia to the corner, and that'll hop over the wall. In that little spot at 3.30, Abisail Garcia has his second double of the day. He's reached base three times. Pretty familiar swing right there, Sean Casey. Every time I see Abisail Garcia go to right field, I think of one guy, Miguel Cabrera. Same type of a swing, drive the ball to right field. Their batting style, batting stance almost the same. If you try to pull this pitch, it's a ground ball to shortstop. Look at that swing that's beautiful, inside out swing, hands back. Look at the balance, keeps his head right on line. I don't know hitting, Sean, but I know one thing, that's a beautiful <laughs> swing. <laughs> right, Danny, and they, you're, you're, so, you're so right. I mean, they're like, he's like a mini me version of Cabrera, and his swing, his body type, everything. It's just not the numbers. Couple different numbers from Miguel, Miguel Cabrera and Garcia. But look, they look exactly the same, and that was a perfect swing. Yeah, it's Mini Miggy. Mini Miggy, exactly. That's what they called him on his way up the system in Detroit. You know, it's been a rough year when a guy like Keston here comes into play right now, hitting 231. One of the things he was able to do throughout his minor league career, and it's one of the reasons why the Brewers drafted him in the first round out of Cal. Great. That the ball skills. There was a little bit of question about his play at second base. Was he going to be able to throw, catch, and throw enough at the big league level? It's kind of what's happened up and down this Brewers lineup this year. This is one guy, along with Christian Yelich, that I think Craig Council and Brewer fans were they were depending on those two guys in general. It's been a slow go, but hey, seven nothing Brewers on top. Less than three weeks of baseball left. All be forgotten. With a strong next three weeks, Sean. Uh, you know it's funny too. I, I think too with with Keston here and his and his uh, his swing. He's more of a higher average type of guy with some with some pop in there. And his damage numbers. He got 11 home runs, 25 RBIs. And I always looked out through a, through the course of a six month season. You always said to yourself, they can't take the damage numbers away from you, and the average will will, will figure itself out. But big pop up right there. Got in on Keston here's hands and got him to pop up. He flies out and he is fair. I'll give him that. And I mean that because Satcast powered by Google Cloud, he distributes his home runs to all fields. That's pretty. Well, I see too, there's 11 home runs, you know, 19 last year, 11 home runs already this season. Like, this guy can hit and he's going to get hot at some point with uh, moving his batting average up. They would like an MVP ish last few weeks from this man. Christian Yelich, second on the team in homers. First couple of bats, he looked like he had a really difficult time gauging Matthew Boyd. Took some fastballs that were down the middle, weighed at a couple of big, slow breaking balls. Unleashes. There you go. And finds plenty of open real estate. And that's going to bring in Garcia. Christian Yelich knocks home a run and the Brewers lead it eight nothing. Off Sean, the that, Sean, sorry Scott. Sean that that's the swing that we saw last year in 2018 that made this guy a National League MVP. A ball on the inner third of the plate and he does damage. Another uh, good look at this swing. Really Sean. gets through it right here. Middle in and you know great job too. Drives at the right center. If he's in there spinning he pulls that the first base. But because he gets through the baseball and he's able to drive it to right center. That's Christian Yelich. That's the guy we know right there. Shoots a great backspin on the ball. He's able to shoot that gap. That's a nice sign right there for the Brewers. And it keeps the on base streak going for Christian Yelich well, at 28 games. And there's nothing worse in baseball when then when your team is waking and, and at the end of the game you go I missed the hit parade. The hit parade went by and I didn't get any hits and you know driving any runs. So Christian Yelich jumped on the hit parade today. Everyone getting in on the action in the Brewers lineup so far this afternoon. Eight runs on 11 hits. Let's crank up the volume and have a listen. It's time for a few of the best calls of 2020 with Level Up. On the ground, there it is. His 2,000th career hit as a Tiger, joining that exclusive club. And it brings in Reyes for the first run of the day. He joins Cobb and Kaline, Garinger, Heilman, Crawford, Trammell, and Whitaker in the old English D. What a time to break out of it here for Sogard. It has been a rough go for him at the plate. 
There's a fly ball hit back into right field. It's deep. It is gone! And the Brewers win it! Eric Sogard walks it off! And the Brewers have come from behind big time on a two-run home run by Eric Sogard. Come on! You go figure this one out. First game with three homers in the first inning in three years. Here's Jamer Candelario. Oh, and he my. launches one to left. That ball's deep. That ball's gone. Are you kidding me? No. This is incredible. Baby first candy. pitch swinging into the left field seats. Oh, uh, look who wins. <laughs> <laughs> Who would finish the mile first? Thanks to everyone for helping us out on so YouTube funny. with our interactive poll question. Dan Plesak takes the mile. You got it, Sack. Sean, that's a whole lot of slow right there, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's called a slow ride right there. Boy, if Jim Leland had a chance to watch that race, I'm sure he's sitting home right now in a Pittsburgh suburb watching this on YouTube going, there's a lot of guys I'd like to watch race, but those two probably aren't two that I'd like to watch, right? I know. Oh, man. So, so frustrating. It's a slow burn. I used to look back at myself, Ron. I'm like, I look like I'm ice skating in quicksand. Like, what am I doing? Like, who? I used to run with my arms across the body. I'm like, let's clean that up at some point. Never did that. Ronnie Garcia in the game gets Jed Jerko to pop one up. And oh, woof. catch is made. Wasn't easy. That's Willie Castro bringing it in. Well, let's flash back to why Dan Plesak <laughs> takes the victory. I knew, I knew it was coming. In 2006, I knew it was coming. thought he had a base knock. Oh, man. I thought I thought Joe Creedy caught it. I really did. I really did. What an embarrassing moment. But I thought Joe Creedy caught the ball. Next thing I know, Pablo Zeus was picking up in left field. I was like, oh, dear God. I'm going to get thrown out from left as I'm running down the first base. But at least I didn't hit it and then it was running out of the box. I did stop and turn for a couple of seconds there. You know what I mean? Did you think about how many times that you were going to be able to watch that back? Yeah, it's phenomenal. I was like, yeah, they're probably going to. That's the only time in Major League Baseball history. <laughs> and it was 5-7-3. It hit the third base and trickled the left, and then they got me. So. Oh, but don't, don't feel bad, Sean, because I know before the broadcast is over, they're going to show my <laughs> home run to Cecil Fielder that <laughs> went out of County Stadium. So that's just that's just the way it goes, Sean, that's around here. Goes. I always say, I always tell my kids, hey, guys, you have to actually play in the big leagues to get something uh, embarrassing. So it's good. I've had a lot of people <laughs> ask me, oh, how did you feel when Cecil hit that ball at a County Stadium? Was it good? I'm like, what's it good? What? Remember, I walked off the mound, and Pete Vukovic was a TV broadcaster, and that game wasn't on locally in Milwaukee that night. I walked down the steps, and he said that ball hit the red gate. And I said, what? He said, yeah, that ball hit the red gate, Lefty. I said, the red gate? He said, yeah, the red gate saloon on the south side of town. <laughs> so great. The red gate. <sighs> oh, man. I think the only time ever Sean pitched for 18 years that I threw a pitch and it was a kaboom like no kaboom I had ever heard. Oh. There's your guy. <laughs> oh there he is. Why do you have to do this to me. I didn't sleep for like three weeks and you know the next like 10 years of my career when they would show like the 50th greatest the 50 greatest home runs the longest ones ever and I'd be stretching with the Phillies or the Pirates and one of the guys would say hey was that you that threw that ball to Cecil. <laughs> Friendly reminder, right? Oh my God. Just when you thought it was safe to go back safe. in the water, right? It's never safe. It's never safe. I'll say this when Big Daddy hit that bomb off me in Milwaukee, didn't stop, stare, ran around the bases. You know? Yeah, next day was the next day was a day game, and Mike Henneman, a reliever for the Tigers, had one of the bat boys come out and <laughs> he told me <laughs> that he had a phony certificate from an insurance company that that ball broke a window in somebody's <laughs> car and they wanted me to pay for the windshield. Oh my gosh. <laughs> hey, it was a handle. long walk to the bullpen the next day, Sean. <laughs> it felt like everybody in Milwaukee was staring at me like, were you the one that gave up that bomb? Oh my gosh.
Oh. Orlando Arcia to the other side. And that's going to fall. It's a base hit. Everybody moving station to station. Base is loaded now. And Luis Arias will step in. By the way, Fielder was two for 12 against you, Dan. So you handle business the rest of the way, pretty much. Scott, don't try to make me feel better. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Let me tell you, that was the loudest two for 12. Uh, and I'll say this. He, he was a player that I really respected, Sean. I know he was a good player and he was a good guy. He was a guy that you rooted for. And I didn't root for him when I was looking at him 60 feet, six inches away. But he was a really good player and his son Prince was a terrific player and early in the game we had a shot of Braun hitting that big home run in 2008 and all I could think of is remembering those celebrations with Braun and yet the Braun and fielder at home plate you know, like that boxing thing that they would oh, do that's right you that's know right. and it was a cool time to be a Brewer fan yeah 2017 18 and 19 a, a, a fun team to watch. And Brewers fan in general, I, I don't think they get enough credit for it's a beautiful ballpark in Milwaukee. They support their team as well as anybody in baseball. Great ballpark food. They love to make fun of themselves. Or not. It, it's a great place to play. And I didn't realize how great it was to play in Milwaukee till I left and played elsewhere. Yeah. Wonderful place to play. Best tailgates in the big leagues too. Genuinely good people yeah. that that care. They love the Brewers. They love the Packers. They love they Badgers love football. They're just yeah. The colder the better. Opening day. I remember 1987 against the Red Sox. Snow flurries. <laughs> they were going nuts. Packed house. We were freezing out in the bullpen, <laughs> thinking we just left Scottsdale for this. <laughs> I used to love pulling up on, on on the bus and the tailgating. The tailgating was just packed house of the. Got the bratwurst going, you know. You got, you got it was. It's like a, it's a sight to see out there in Milwaukee. But they are great fans, knowledgeable fans, and they, and they're, they're involved in the games. All those fans with one goal in mind now. A World Series title. It would be the first in Milwaukee Brewers franchise history. That one is shipped to left, and it's going to fall in fair ground. That's going to be a lot of trouble. We see Yelich coming in. And it'll clear the bases. Luis Arias with the double to knock in three. It's 11 nothing Milwaukee. And that makes it nine extra base hits on the afternoon for this brew crew offense. I wonder how many guys are in the dugout right now showing saying hey Sean let's save some of these right. I know same seats. Hey what are we doing. <laughs> same seats. They've been wearing out that left field corner too. Highest run total for the Brewers this year, 11 runs, and they have really been getting that. You know, we always say in the big leagues, get that line moving. They have really been getting the line moving all day long. It scores Yelich, Braun, and Arcia. A double-digit day for Milwaukee. Uh, the pitcher part of me is now thinking, if you're Corbin Burns, this has been a long top of the sixth inning. Hopefully, he's been able to keep himself warm. Maybe. Going back and forth up into the clubhouse doing some stretching. He's been so good through five innings as good as I've seen him all year. Commanding both sides of the plate with his fastball. Great cutter hard slider. It'll be interesting to see in the bottom of the sixth. How he comes out. After sitting around this has been a long top half of the inning for the Brook group. There have been a few long layoffs between innings for Burns already and you wonder Dan he's been so good you need him down the stretch. Will you limit him a little bit more this afternoon now that it's an 11 nothing lead Do you uh, keep that pitch count in the 80 85 range uh, instead of 100. Well what I want what I would like to do right now this game is for the most part out of hand. I want to make sure that Corbin Burns feels good about himself and the hit parade continues. Tyron Taylor is feeling good. That's his third hit of the day. Arias scores 12 zip Milwaukee. That left field corner is getting worn out. I think if you're Craig Council, the last thing you want to do is say, OK, I want to leave Corbin Burns out there. You want him feeling good about himself. There's a good look at him right now. Trying to keep that jacket and keep a towel, keep that right shoulder warm. I would assume if he could get through this sixth inning, the bottom of the sixth, 
Last thing you want to do is to drive that pitch count up. He's been so good as to leave him out there for three or four runs. You'd like to send him on his way on a good note. Sooner or later, your bullpen has to pick up a couple of innings. Devin Williams is available. Hayter's available. It's not ideal to pitch your high leverage guys in a blowout game like this, but they had the last couple of days off, so that may be something Craig Council wants to do. Three off days in a seven day span for the Brewers. That includes tomorrow. Young Taylor with his first three hit game. A little celebration sanitizer for Craig Council right there. This is what Dan's talking about. Hater, Williams, Yardley. There's your good afternoon, good evening, or good uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Well, I'll tell That's you what, it. Devin Williams right now, and Craig Council told us this when we talked pregame, as good as any reliever right now, not just in the National League, but in all of baseball. He's allowed one run in 17 innings. How about 35 strikeouts in those 17 innings? Yeah. Opponent batting average against 070. And that is not a typo. 070. That changeup reminds me a lot of a former former Brewer, Trevor Hoffman. No doubt about it. He throws harder than Trevor Hoffman. He's in the mid to upper 90s. If you're into numbers, he struck out almost 54 percent of the hitters that he's faced this year. 53.8 percent have ended in strikeouts from Devin Williams. Wow, that's that's electric. The Brewers had David Phelps too in their bullpen. They traded him to Philadelphia. And that put Williams in the setup role. We've seen Hader in a more traditional relief inning role this year. Not as many of the four plus out appearances. In fact, just one of them so far this year for Hader. There's Burns still chilling. Bruku looking to bat around here. That's right, ninth hitter of the sixth. It's Jacob Nottingham. Well, they're chasing some history now. Franchise record for extra base hits in a game is 12. The Brewers check in at 10 already. We're in the sixth. This is one of those day games after a night game two of your run garden hire it, it kind of puts a. A bad taste in your mouth you. Play a pretty good game. Last night you win eight to one starting pitching was good. A clean crisp game crisp game and he run into this one today. Been a rough go for the Tigers. Big bounce back for Milwaukee this afternoon. Corbin Burns back to work. He has been sensational. Christian Yelich traded to the Brewers. What does this deal mean for the Brewers going into 2018? Triple for Yelich. It's a cycle. Grand slam for Christian Yelich. What more can this guy do? Yelich comes up throwing. The tag, he is out. What a play by Yelich. Yelich is going to turn and burn. It's a triple. He hits for the cycle for the second time this year. And there's Yelich deep to right. And this one is gone. Christian Yelich has done it again. Get that guy some hardware. Long run, Yellich makes the play and ends up in the front row. The Brewers MVP comes up with a stellar play. You're looking at the National League most valuable player, Christian Yellich. He's not just a good player who has great moments. He's now in the elite category. Christian Yelich just hit his third home run in this game. The Brewers will walk it off tonight. Christian Yelich delivers again. Are you ready for this? My time, my moment.
Introducing MLB Film Room, powered by Google Cloud. Create custom reels and search 3.5 million videos. That's right, watch, create, share, only at MLB.com slash Film Room. And don't miss any action during the 2020 season. Follow MLB on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for highlights and more. Last of the sixth, here come the Tigers. Eight, nine, and one, starting with Grayson Griner. And the Corbin Burns show continues. His 70th pitch of the day is just as good as the previous ones. This is as good as I've seen Corbin Burns all season long. Both glove side and arm side. He's thrown consecutive breaking balls, and you've seen swings at the second one that are just as bad as the first, which leads you to believe the rotation is tight. There's another one right there. Ooh. This has been the Corbin Burns show. He has fanned three in a row, nine on the day. The base runner count in this game, 20 on base for Milwaukee, just one off Corbin Burns. There's a good look at that hard slider right there. You can see his fingers up over the, the top third of the outside of the ball. Fastball command has been on point, but that hard slider and cutter has made him look like Brandon Woodruff up to this point. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Brewers feel like if they could get this offense going, They've got a big shot. Adrian Hauser is another guy in that rotation that has a big arm. Woodruff, Hauser, and if Corbin Burns can continue pitching like this, Brew Crew may be in business. There's a good fastball that's been in. Craig Council has to love what he's seeing so far from his right hander. The throwing the belt ball great. With 2 0 oh coming into this with an ERA in the low twos at 2.35, he's been in command. Repeating his delivery, staying within himself. This is swing and miss pitching staff. Many thanks to Williams, Hader, Yardley, the big trio, and the back end of the bullpen. It's a great point, though, Dan. If Milwaukee can find its way into the playoffs, in the past we saw them work with their bullpen quite a bit. They actually have three legitimate starting pitchers to use in this rotation. With the three names you mentioned, Hauser, Woodruff, and Corbin Burns right now, clearly solidifying a spot. It's been directly opposite of what the Brewers had been in 2017, 18, and 19, where they relied heavily on their bullpen, Josh Hader in particular. If this offense, with three weeks to go, can find himself the last at bat with Christian Yelich, I thought was a, a huge positive. He drilled a ball in the gap. Right center field get smashes up, a ball to third, and Arias will recover. He has quite the arm, wow. but he's called safe. Paredes with an infield knock. He has a BB over there at third. Wow. It was just the fact that there was a play at first base. The recovery, and he knows how good his arm is because he still attempted the throw. Oh. Looks like Craig Council wants this one reviewed. I think he got him. Wow, that might be close. a little bit closer than we thought. You he, see him right there. Good reflex. He, he should have caught it, and that's why. I, and then he comes up and just, I mean, that's a cannon. Got him. He got him. Got him. Nice scoop there by Jed Jerko. Look at Jerko out front. Wow. And he goes and gets this ball. One of the keys, Sean, is he started with his glove down. And it's a lot easier if you keep your glove down and you scoop up yep. and expect the ball to bounce high. And that's the one that skims underneath your glove. He did a great job right, Danny. You almost have to attack the pick. And they did a great job of staying down and picking to it up. Great, great play all around. I think he got him, though. Wow. They've loved his defense at their base. Wow. They love it even more now. What He's out. Play. Well, when it's your day, it's your day. And Corbin Burns not only pitching well, but he, I wouldn't say catches a break, but a terrific play by Urias there to knock that ball down and a strong throw across the diamond. This Brewers ball club plays some mean defense. Jerko with a nice pick, too, on the back end. This is just the guy you'd like to see up that being Reyes if you're Burns struck him out twice once looking once swinging. 
This is pinch hitter Derek Hill. You think this will be it, Danny, for Burns after this? I don't, because I think right now he's throwing the ball as well right now as he did in the second, third, or fourth inning. Uh, the, you know, Craig Council, and they'll have a much better set of eyes. They've seen him, but he's continuing to pound the strike zone. You look at him right there, he looks calm. His demeanor looks terrific. Doesn't look stressed at all. Staying within his delivery. Another good breaking ball right there just off the plate. One of the things I think he's doing a much better job too. He's staying much more directional. If you'll watch him, he'll get into a habit at times when things are going bad when he overthrows. He'll fall off a little bit more towards first base. He's taking that head. He's driving that brim of that ball cap right towards home plate. That is socked to left, right to a glove. It's Christian Yelich to put it away. Three up, three down. The usual from Corbin Burns. He has done that in five out of his six innings so far this afternoon. Brewers up big. We're in the seventh. Let's take a look around the majors. That's my best old school news broadcaster voice. Sound good, Ronnie. Thank you. Cy Young candidate Max Fried to the injured list. That's a tough one for Atlanta. Remember, they lost Soroka earlier in the year. Will Myers with a grand slam. The Patriots have hit seven grand. Slam Diego. What's this all about? The Bronx is burning. Brian Cashman says fans deserve better baseball. Do you think the Yankees are going to bounce back? I don't know, man. There, there, a lot of injuries to bounce back from with Judge being out and Stanton being out. And, you know, just the bats aren't really uh, coming alive. I don't know. I, I think they're in trouble. I think a bigger concern for me right now is the bullpen, which has been rock solid the last four or five years. And one thing's the Yankees that they could always depend on was if they had a lead going into the fifth or sixth inning, it was locked down. Adam Adovino has struggled and he's one of their main go to guys troubleshooters. Need to get Zach Britton back into the mix. Chapman's not getting a chance to save many games. Lineup is not hitting. Kind of going through what the Brewers are going through. Jay Happ was really good last night. Lost a tough decision. Two to one. Pitched very well. Normally not what we've seen from the Yankees. And they have very little time to get it turned around. Look at the Orioles. Only a half a game behind the Bombers. Look at the Tigers. A game back in that wild card race. So what looked like the Yankees being a cinch a week ago is anything but with less than three weeks to go. Yeah they have multiple teams chasing them and some of those teams are playing with that nothing to lose mentality which makes you really dangerous with just two and a half weeks to go in the season. Third bullpen member for the Tigers today, Kyle Funkhauser, with a called strike. Garcia not too pleased with that one. A little down, a little in. It looked a little down, a little in, yeah. But as a hitter, you just have to say, I can't control that. I got to come back and find a way to get this pitch. JP, what do you have on this playoff race? 
Well, thinking about the Orioles, Scott, they're actually adding talent at a time when the Yankees are struggling. Keegan Aiken joins the rotation in Baltimore. Dean Kramer beating the Yankees in his debut. Uh, and I think Sean and Dan touched on it. Young teams hungry this time of year are very dangerous. The Orioles have nothing to lose. Frankly, the Tigers, the same is true for them as well. And an excellent experience. There's Sergio Alcantara in at second base for Jonathan Scope. And Derek Hill, who plays a mean center field, will replace Victor Reyes out there. I know, I know, Danny, you know, thinking back, 12 nothing game when you have a packed house is tough to play. Let alone a 12 nothing game when there's no one in the crowd and you start to lose that adrenaline. That's you got to mentally really kind of stay in the game and particularly day game after a night game. If you're one of the eight guys out there in the field right now, you're just your legs start to get heavy. It's hard not to look past and look towards tomorrow's game when it's four or five nothing late. I'm not sure where that pitch was. That's a pretty good pitch right there. But it's tough. This is. I guess now where you're you're similar to the dog days of August you're getting into the month of September. You have a game like this where you come off a big win last night and emotionally it's hard to keep that to keep focus in the game at hand and one pitch one bat at a time when you're down 12 to nothing. Not an easy thing to do. Eric Sogard makes a cameo today. That's it for Keston Hira on the afternoon. This is the spot too. I know whenever you're getting blown out this is a spot for Craig Council to say okay I get some of my starters out of this game give them a blow give them a couple innings off with a day off tomorrow. Yeah it's the one thing that the Brewers have that many other ball clubs don't is some rest mixed in tomorrow yes. and I mentioned in, in the past seven days if you include tomorrow three off days where we're talking about some teams that are in stretches like the Marlins of 28 games in 24 days. The Cardinals are playing a ton of baseball down the stretch and the Brewers will match up against them 10 times. So if you're thinking about Milwaukee and being well rested maybe they take on a Cardinals team that is fatigued at that point. Yeah you could be right Brian and uh, that's what they that's what they're wishing for because they can, they're going to have to beat the Cardinals straight up with having I think what did you say 10 games against them down the stretch 10 games in 14 days and the runners moving up to second Garcia in scoring position now one two pitch will come up to Eric Sogard JP you know there's magic with this Milwaukee team in September right. Well there is and remember Scott Craig Council took this job more than five years ago. He's really a great fit for this organization. Of course he grew up in nearby Whitefish Bay Wisconsin he played for the organization for a long time. Then he took some time worked in the front office I remember seeing him he was scouting and doing a lot of work there. So we got to know the real mechanics of the organization great relationship with David Stearns and again like. Dan and Sean has some Jim Leland ties as well. I remember Craig telling me the story about the first time he got traded from the minor leagues with the Rockies to go to the Marlins on their way to winning the championship in 97. And Craig said that his first conversation with Jim went something like this. Jim asked him, Craig, can I trust you to make the plays and be a good ball player? Craig said yes. And then Jim discussed a lot of Notre Dame football after that, of course, Craig's alma mater. <laughs> That's so great. There's a knock for Sogar, Garcia to third. They call it Craig Tember. Craig Tember. That's September now. <laughs> he is a mastermind, though. You know what? He's he pulls he's pushed a lot of the right buttons. And Craig Council playing against him as a player and getting to know him throughout my career, man. This guy was a gamer. Everyone always asks me, "Hey, at first base, who was the best conversation or who didn't talk to you?" And the one guy that pops in my head every time is Craig Council. Never said anything to me. It was so annoying. I'd be like, "Hey, what's up, Council? Way to swing it." He wouldn't say anything. He'd get his sign for the third base coach, get his lead, and he was so into the game. So as the years went on, I just stopped saying anything to him. I just, whatever, man. That sounds like a future manager. <laughs> exactly. I was like, you're going to be a great manager one day, Counts, because you don't say anything over here at first base. You're the only player. <laughs> you and Ricky Henderson. 
He's thinking strategy. Uh, he was. He was so locked in. You know, he was old school like that. Christian Yelich still in the game. So this is someone in the past who would get the rest of the day off, but he's trying to find his rhythm. Hit a bullet in his last at bat. It was a fastball that was in the inner third. He one hopped the wall in right field, Scott. And I think Greg Council's looking at this right now. Likes the matchup, getting him a chance to see another right handed pitcher. Pitcher that's laboring a little bit. Get some count leverage here, 3 0. If you're Christian Yelich, certainly I doubt they're going to turn him loose in a 12 to nothing game, 3 0, but get this count back to 3 and 1 and get a pitch and maybe he'd like to end his day hitting a couple of balls hard. You're not allowed to swing at that 3 0, right? If it's 12 0. Well, You've I mean, over it, that. Nowadays, maybe. Fernando Tatis <laughs> Jr. says it's okay. I thought that was okay. 7 0. Nowadays, with, with the balls flying out of the park, you never know what, what leads safe. That's true. Statcast powered by Google Cloud. I mean, Christian Yelich last year through 38 games already had 16 homers. He's up to nine this year through the same number. And what comes with that too is pitchers pitch a little differently. Don't be surprised if you don't see a 3 2 breaking ball here with first and third. Last thing you want to do is just go ahead and groove one in. You know, you can look up at that average as a pitcher. And trust me, when you're on that mound 60 feet 6 inches away, the last thing you're thinking of Christian Yelich being a 220 hitter. The strikeout rate right now is a career high. That's what you have to keep in mind though as he gets the free base. It's only 38 games. Right. In a normal season, a 38 game nine homer performance is no big deal because he could run through the world for a few months. Well, we also go back to spring training. You know, Craig Council was talking to us about it, about, you know, after coming back from breaking his knee, his kneecap last, this was a September 10th or some, somewhere around you know, there. But, yeah, and, he, and, then he, and then he came back. Only had one game at spring training before the season really got started. They had a few years, a few games there before when they started up again. Listen, this is a game of timing, of rhythm, you know, and and sometimes, you know, th maybe this first month, Christian Yelich is almost using it like spring training, but if you give Christian Yelich six months, the back of the baseball card doesn't lie. He's going to put up some big numbers. Back-to-back -back batting titles. He's just miss missing pitches that he usually does not miss. Even changed his approach a little bit. Softened the leg kick a bit, try and get his timing back. Base is loaded. Nobody down. Jed Jerko went around. Well, he's probably anxious and excited because he already has one in his pocket. Opposite field. Thank you very much. 385 feet. And that gets the job done. What's that about row 17? Yeah, that's a that's a bomb right there. Well, one of the things that has hurt Matthew Boyd has been the long ball. He had given up 50 home runs. The most in baseball since the beginning of 2019 and a couple long balls again. That total is going up up and up and Ron Gardenhire a little disappointed. His last couple of starts were much better and uh, Brew Crew just laid it on Matthew Boyd. See that top five NL home run rate for Jed Jerko that means play the man every day and that's been the story lately. Craig Council said that too you know. Jerko's getting the bats. He's swinging it. We need him down the stretch. He's going to keep getting them. In a normal season, they wouldn't have cut Justin Smoke and Brock, Brock Holt so quickly. No. But this is a sprint. This is not a normal season. This is a sprint. Jerko on the ground. And that'll be two in exchange for a run. 13 now for Milwaukee. Garcia scores. You know, about 90 miles south of Milwaukee, David Ross is finding himself in a similar dilemma. Chris Bryant hasn't hit very much. Javi Baez has not hit that well. For the Cubs, Ian Happ and Jason Kipnis have kind of carried the offensive load. There's another team that their, their starting pitching has been good. John Lester has struggled. Kyle Hendricks has been terrific. You Darvish oh, might be the leader right now for the NL Cy Young Award. So. Two teams, both the Brewers and the Cubs, their starting pitching has held up the end of the bargain. 
Cubs bullpen has struggled a little bit more than the Brewers. I'd love to see this guy swinging like that. Ryan Braun goes long. Wow. Braun for two. It's 15 nothing. Well, that's what Ryan Bar Braun usually does. You know, he's a guy too. You see in that lineups had a had a few back issues this season, but you know, you you hang one to Ryan Braun like that. You hang it, he bangs it. And that ball was out over the plate, just kind of sitting up there. Was he was able to really get his arms extended and really skies this ball to left field. He's reached base four times today. Two singles, a walk, and that homer. It's the 11th extra base hit of the day for Milwaukee. Now one shy of a franchise record in a single game. And seven outs to work with. Garcia uh -oh. spikes that one. That's just a single. One of those afternoons. My last year in Milwaukee in 1992, Scott, we were chasing the Toronto Blue Jays. The, Blue, the Brewers at that time were in the American League East. We beat Jimmy Key and the Toronto Blue Jays 22 to 2. Wow. And the then Sky Dome, which is now the Rogers Center. So, Brew Crew on their way right now with 15 in. And it doesn't look like it's getting any easier for the Tigers right now. These guys are barreling up everything today. Roller. And that'll do it for the seven. More action for Milwaukee. It's Braun powering up. The Brew Crew bringing the bats in bunches today. 17 hits, 11 extra bases. From Nationals Park here in Washington, D.C., it's the Brewers and the Nationals in game one of one game only. Max Scherzer on the mound to a standing ovation. The place is already popping. To right and well hit. That ball is out of here. A first inning two-run shot by Grandal. Get up. Get up. It is gone for Eric Thames. And the Brewers lead 3-0. This one is well hit, and it is gone! It's Trey Turner's first career postseason homer. Steven Strasburg on in relief for the first time in his career. A swing and a miss, he struck him out of the curveball. So three scoreless innings for Steven Strasburg. And Josh Hader trying to nail it down. Fly, fly, base hit to right! That'll score one, that'll score two as the ball gets away. That's going to score three runs! It's Washington ball! It might be one of those days as the Tigers account in the live chat says Gardenhire hates using position players to pitch but 15 nothing two more innings and a doubleheader tomorrow could be a tough spot. Hey, make seven pregame picks that feature the storylines around the league and compete for cash every day with MLB Quick Pick. Restrictions apply. See rules and enter at MLB.com slash Quick Pick. Yeah, it might be a position player kind of afternoon for the Tigers in the eighth and or the ninth. Corbin Burns is the starter for Milwaukee, still going strong. Not an easy thing to do to keep your concentration in a game that's 15 to nothing. You walk the line of pounding the strike zone and another really good changeup right there out in front. It's pulled to Jerko who handles it for out number one. Another poll question to bring in. Who owns the nastiest pitch in baseball right now? Devin Williams in that changeup has literally been unhittable. Shane Bieber's curve, Tyler Glasnow's curve. Or Josh Hader and that slider, which he keeps using more and more. It's become an insane weapon in addition to the fastball. Wow, that's a tough one. All right, Dan Plesak, our pitcher. Good luck. 
You go first, as I let everyone know. The poll is up there right now. Check it out on your mobile device, on your computer. Everyone get involved. This Shane, is the tough one. This is the tough, this part is a of the tough one. But that's Shane Bieber curveball right now. I mean, it's, it's hard to say in a game that is cluttered with so many really good starting pitchers. Jacob DeGrom is on its way to winning his third consecutive NL Cy Young, but Shane Beaver might be as good as anybody or the best pitcher in the game right now. That curveball that he throws is awful nasty. Great arm action. He can spin it. He can tilt it. He can throw it straight down. He can throw it across. Change his speeds. I'm going to go Shane Beaver in a tight one. Uh, I just I think with Devin Williams's strikeouts per uh, per nine innings it is like striking out 54 percent of the guys. I just think that changeup he has sack has to be just off the charts dirty. Craig Council said it's somewhat of a screwball. Yeah. Travis Demerit, the pinch hitter, now in the two spot in the order. The rest of the day off for scope. Good time for that hard cutter slider down and away to try to get a punch out. I remember when I used to when Hideo Nomo was pitching for the Dodgers. I for some reason I couldn't get a beat on it. He threw. A, he threw me a fastball right down the middle, and I'd swing and miss. It was, you know, it, it was obviously a split finger, you know, talking about that that split action. And I remember I came in the dugout, and Jack McKeon's like, "Hey, just don't swing at that pitch. It, you know, it's it's a split finger." I'm like, "Yeah, I know it is, Jack, but at 56 feet, it looks like it's right down the middle." And right when I go to swing, an elevator shafts me about seven feet. It drops. So you come out there and hit it. It's unbelievable. It's the nastiest pitch of baseball, but it's a good one. If you're bringing that change up, good. Luck. Oof. Some heat from Burns. 94 miles an hour with a little cut action. This has been a clinic for Corbin Burns. He's faced one over the limit. One blemish. A triple from Willie Castro in the fifth inning. There's a good look at it. That hard cutting action. Looks like it's straight. Just tails off right through the strike zone. His third career 10 strikeout performance. A little more on Devin Williams than that changeup from JP. Hey, JP. Yes, Scott. Uh, Craig Council said this week on MLB Network Radio that he has only seen one player, one, Francisco Lindor, actually put the changeup in play the first time they had seen it. He basically said that Lindor was sitting on it, sitting changeup, and that he had to be sitting on Williams' changeup that much just to put the ball in play. Simply remarkable. Now, one quick note as well on one of the two great bronze that I know from the University of Miami, that being Ryan, who homered today. Uh, on, on that note, of course, Ryan played with Mike Cameron, the father of Daz. And so when I texted Mike to congratulate him today, he said, I bet you Brawny feels pretty old. Daz was running around taking BP back in the day. Now they're on the same field. Uh, but one note on Ryan, uh, his, of course, his contract is up after this year. It's a mutual option for 2021. So far right now, Scott, he is undecided on playing next year, but he said after coming back from the quarantine time that he was more likely than he had been before to play one more year in 2021. Thanks JP. No relation by the way for anyone that's going to have the chat. Corbin Ooh. Burns right now stepped in a big old bucket of sassy. <laughs> <laughs> he is nasty today. Seven shutout frames from Corbin Burns. This man belongs in a big league rotation. Left center field in for a base hit, rounding third, heading home, and the game is tied three to three. One out in the seventh, four to three, Detroit. And he lines it to back. Back goes Martinez, gone. Gosh, he's saying, I can get him. Well, we'll see. We don't want to walk you. We don't want to walk you. He swings as a long drive to right, and it is a home run. A three-run homer, the Tigers lead it 8-4 in the eighth inning. Wings of this, a fly ball to left, 
Here comes Herndon. He's there. He's got it. The Tigers are the champions of 1984. The race for the postseason is on. Catch all the action from around the league online or on your favorite devices on MLB.tv. Now only $24.99. Visit MLB.tv. More beautiful work on the mound from Corbin Burns, who pitched in the seventh. That should be it for him. And this is another man on the mound out of the bullpen for Detroit, Joe Jimenez. ERA not pretty. He definitely brings it, and this is a guy who's had this stuff for years, entered the year as the closer, has lost the job, and also looking to find himself again on the mound. He'll go up against 8-9-1 and one in the Brewers' order, beginning with Tyrone Taylor, who has his first career three-hit performance. You know, Sean, before every game, you'll hear Banner in the dugout. All right, fellas, let's put up some crooked numbers. How about this for the Brewers? Three in the second, three in the fourth, five in the sixth, and three in the seventh. <laughs> talk about, talk about. load of crooked numbers for the broker. This is like Harvey's wall bangers in 1992, 1982. Danny, on my score sheet, I just feel like it just it's a run on sentence. It just keeps running into each other. Guys, just keep hitting. That's the back of Taylor. And he's on to first. Serious question. Do you believe that? Say after seven innings, if it's ten runs or more, we call it a day. Mercy what? rule? No. No, you're professional players. You never know. You could, I've, you know, you like you saw the other day uh, with the Blue Jays put up a ten spot in the sixth inning. I mean, these, they can do it. So. Now, if I'm watching my kids play, like twelve-year-old <laughs> travel all-star, I'm like, let's go, let's get out of here, kids. Ten. Uh, after five innings, ten runs. See ya. Oh yeah, by the third inning, you're already thinking about oh the pizza after the I game. You're like, it. I'm getting hungry. Can we just call this thing? I gotta right? get out of here. <laughs> Want to get a burger on the way home? Some chicken wings or something. Jeez. And Nottingham fouls it off. Bite. Big day for Milwaukee. Well on their way to snapping a three game losing skid. This is their season low mark four games under 500. That's going to change very soon. We started the year 10 and 10. 8 and 12 in their next 20. And that's caught for out number one. Candelario makes the play. And J.P. Morosi has more on this special day in Major League Baseball. Thanks, Scott. As you see, Joe Jimenez from San Juan, Puerto Rico, wearing the number 21 of the great Roberto Clemente. And we talk a lot in baseball about how the Clemente Award truly is the greatest single award that any player can receive in the game. And it's important, I think, Scott, to talk about the candidates for the award as if it is another award like the MVP or the Cy Young because it does involve that much effort and work and really years of philanthropy and thinking about those who are less fortunate around the game. And, and I think that his legacy, Clemente's legacy in so many ways, Scott, is evident in the way you see players around the game treating one another and thinking about those who are disadvantaged in the communities around them. So I think it's the legacy that everybody tries to live up to now, still a half century after Clemente's passing. And Sean, you won that award. Yeah, 2004, you know, I, I got the, uh, for, for the Reds, you know, not the big one, but for our team. Uh, and it means a lot, man. It means a lot to me. Like I said, I'm from, grew up in Pittsburgh. I always wore number 21. Um, and I knew what that meant to so many people. Um, you know, playing with playing with a lot of different guys and 
Uh, but I, my, my, my good friend Dwayne Reeder owns, uh, runs the Roberto Clemente Museum um, um, down uh, in Pittsburgh. And it's a special place, man. And it just reiterates Vera Clemente has given him a lot of stuff. And, they, you know, they have so many. Uh, they, they tell the story of Roberto Clemente and how much of huma a humanitarian he was, how great of a player he was, what he meant to the Latino community, and what he meant to baseball. And you know what? Just a legend. And I just, I, I personally think that some, someday I'll hope to see number 21 retired all throughout baseball. You know, we're seeing many players wear that number 21 today. I mentioned earlier, the entire Pittsburgh Pirates, including personnel beyond players on the fields wearing 21. Sogard with a little bouncer and a step on the bag. And we are done with the top of the eighth. Well, it's a rare inning where the Brewers don't capitalize. That should be it for Corbin Burns, but stick with us and we'll see. With the first pick in the 2020 MLB draft, the Detroit Tigers select Spencer. You know, the draft happened, and that was probably the best day of my life. A close second, Spencer says, is signing his contract and heading to Comerica Park. Good to have you in us, man. For Major League Baseball's first ever summer camp. All these people are telling me I belong, so enough of that. A lot of people tell me I belong here. You know, it kind of convinces your brain that you do. And I told him it was, I had to swallow my pride to be able to talk to a Sun Devil. Um, but uh, it's uh, it, it worked out okay, and uh, he seems like a great guy. He's a great addition to the organization. Um, you know, as he was walking down the hallway, I was talking with Mickey, and Mickey started yelling at him, "Hey, get on this side of the locker room soon. We need you." Mickey's the man. Uh, he's I met him once, and he's been so nice. And you know, for a Hall of Famer to say that, it's, it's special, and it's something that'll never forget. You know, second day in the organization, Mickey's saying that. It's it's, uh, it's really cool. And to answer the question, yes, the day is done for Corbin Burns. Ryan Yardley about to take over. It's 15-0 Brewers with a big day all around. And you're going to see the Brewers again on YouTube for the game of the week on Friday, September 18th. It's the Royals taking on Milwaukee at Miller Park. And then one more on this slate, Friday, September 25th, Reds Twins. Some central action to break down. And we'll talk more about those matchups after the game. But right now, let's put a bow on this poll. Nastiest pitch in baseball belongs to, wow, that was close. Shane Bieber, your pick, Dan Plesak. 29% just slightly edges out Williams and Hayter, who probably canceled each other out with a lot of the Milwaukee fans. Shane Bieber right now, you're talking about, I think he's made the biggest strides. What's lost last year, his punch out total last year was astounding. I think. 259 strikeouts he had last year and he's quietly put himself in the mix as one of the top three or four pitchers in the game and one of the many reasons why the Cleveland Indians are making a lot of noise. I don't think a team in baseball Sean Casey de just develops drafts and prepares their minor league pitchers as well as the Indians do. I, I totally agree with you Dan Chris Antonetti that whole front office. They do a great job. I was drafted by that organization. I feel like they still have that same philosophy. They do a great job of developing guys in the minor leagues, of giving them every resource they can. They have great coaches, and uh, you're right. They, they're, they're, you're seeing, you're seeing the, uh, you're seeing the, the fruits of, of that great development now in the big leagues. Second hit of the day for the Tigers. Willie Castro with the only two knocks today. A triple. And a single. He tripled off Corbin Burns. Otherwise, he was ridiculous, Dan. You know what? If this holds up, he'll move to 3 0 in the year. He lowered his ERA in the year to 1.99. Arm side strength, arm side, glove side, inside, outside. Heartbreaking balls doubled up. He's been good all year, but this is the best I've ever seen Corbin Burns. And what I really like was pitching with a lot of positivity and a lot of energy. Terrific outing if you're Craig Council right now with. 
little less than three weeks to go. Brandon Woodruff, Adrian Hauser, and Corbin Burns. One, two, three stacks up pretty well in that tough NL Central. Danny, you could see it from Jump Street. I mean, Corbin Burns, he was coming at you. He was filling up the strike zone with great stuff, late movement, crisscrossing the plate from, from pitch one, and he just kept it going through seven. I think a couple of positives from the game, not only the outing by Burns, good at bat. Christian Yelich hit a bullet in the sixth inning off the wall. Ryan Braun with a big home run. Three hit afternoon for Ryan Braun to get him going. The middle part of this order can get going. This is a much better offensive team that they've been up to this point. One of the few times in the last, say, handful of seasons where the starting pitching for Milwaukee has held up its end of the bargain. There's a guy that uh, they can get Yelich going. It's going to be a big difference. You know, it's funny. You think about it being 15 nothing, and usually during a six month season, I think you would have Yelich out of the game. But I think now they want to get him as many at bats as possible, as many looks as he can. No, there's only a few weeks to go. They got to get him hot. So anytime he can see some more pitches, I think that's why he's still in the game. No, he scheduled the lead off the next inning. He drew a walk in his last at bat, hit that big double in the sixth inning. Looked like he was tracking the ball much better in his last at bat. Laid off a 3 2 breaking ball that was down and in and drew the walk. Tip of the cap there to you, Sean. He was waving to you, saying, Come on, Sean, keep talking to me. <laughs> he has that glare, too, going right now. He does. Well, there aren't many players in baseball that can take a team and carry them on your back. 2018, you're looking at the NL MVP, and last year was having another monster year and fouled the ball off his kneecap. I thought that was going to be into Milwaukee in the month of September. They played great baseball without him. But make no bones about it, they missed having him in that lineup. Two keys to this team. Uh, Josh Hader is such a big, important part of their bullpen. When you play Milwaukee, it's a race to try to keep Hader out of the game. And if you're Craig Council, it's a race to try to get him in as soon as you can. You don't want to burn him out or have him pitch too much. But Hader is the key from the pitching standpoint. And on the offensive side, they need to get Christian Yelich going. If so, they could do some damage here. We've discussed Devin Williams and Josh Hader. And this is the third member of that dangerous trio in the back end of the bullpen. We last saw Eric Yardley on Sunday against Cleveland, a scoreless inning, one hit, one walk, and a strikeout. Two pitches, the sinker and the curveball, and he's that sidearm submariner that gives you a different look. Well, in the, in the day and age where four seam and velocity plays, he's a different look. There's that sinking action when he's good. That's what he gets, the ground ball. And they just get the added second. Bonifacio safe at first on a fielder's choice. A little bit of a slow developing play there. Urias had a difficult time with the transition, getting the ball from his glove to second base with anything on it. Off the bat, it looked like a routine double play. You see this high chop area. He does a good job what? coming in and getting yeah. it on the short hop. Yeah, that's a great job, Danny, of coming in and really charging it and getting that short hop. That's a tough play. These guys, <laughs> Dan, isn't it amazing though? Now you watch it. These guys make it look so easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, and that was an in, that was an in between hop. He did a really good job. Yeah. And after watching it the second time, looked like Sogar didn't have a real good handle. Almost looked like he threw a change little up. hand grenade or yeah. change up over the first base. Cameron to second, and this is going to be two. Yeah, that's sweet. Arcia with a little athleticism. Well, they're going to challenge that, I bet you. You think so? I think so. In a 15 0 game? Why not? <laughs> Look at Arcia go. Oh, oh, you got him. Got him. You got him. So, Willie Castro's 2 for 3 for Detroit. The rest of the Tigers are 0 for 22. Defense is clean today for Milwaukee.
uses his hand and Jared recovers to throw him out. How he would say glove save and a beauty. Huh. The 30 year old Nick Turley the last picks in the 2008 draft by the Yankees. 10 years in the minor leagues grinding his way to the big league level. This one is launched. Josh Bell ring your bell with a bomb. He certainly didn't miss that one. Do you win something if it hits the car? He should. Fly ball right field. Eaton venturing back to the track, to the wall, and he can't get it. It's off the top of the wall, and it's gone from the bounce off the top of the fence. I have never seen that before. Wow, that hit on the inside part of the fence and then went backwards. First career pitching appearance for Travis Demerit coming up. Google Cloud is helping to power StatCast with massive amounts of data points to reveal new insights, taking you deeper into the game than ever before. Google Cloud is the official cloud technology of Major League Baseball. Scott Braun, Sean Casey, Dan Plesak, JP Morosi, we are in the ninth. Travis Demerit, your turn. Milwaukee pouring on 15 runs this afternoon. Well, Christian Yelich is going to get that extra at bat, but it comes against a position player. Oh, man, there's nothing worse than <laughs> facing the position player. Oh, no, it could be good, though, because if Demerit lays one in there, Yelich can get a freebie, but. Oh, there we go. On the oh. ground sharply. So that hurts the confidence. Well, at least he hit it hard. You still feel good when you hit a rocket. But, yeah, no doubt when your position player gets you out, it does not feel good. There's something that tells me that Demerit was a pitcher sometime. If you look at his delivery, <laughs> it's a smooth delivery. And Christian Yelich is thinking, are you kidding me? This is the kind of year it's been. But you watch, you look at his delivery. He's very balanced over the top of the rubber. Loose arm delivery. Jet Jerko is trying to mess with his timing. <laughs> Timeout was called by Jerko. Yeah, the nice rock and fire, and Jerko launches. Oh, there's a goodbye. Rock, there's a rocket shake, rattle, and roll right there. A little two homer day for wow. Jed Jerko. Right down the middle, right down Bravo. That's what you gotta love, you know. Jerko calls timeout, gets a pitch though, right there. That's a batting practice fastball, 80 miles an hour, middle in. That's something you'd be crushed just like that. This is the previous pitch. Was it a wait? Hold up. It's a position player. Let me think about this. Come on, come on. He was trying to rattle him right there. You're like, yeah, that, I don't know what's going on here. Next pitch. Boom. He got him. Oh, see, that's the worst. 81. <laughs> Slow stuff. Ryan Braun pops it up. For Jerko, by the way, second. Multi homer performance of the season. He has seven in his career. He's looking at the scouting report. It said strike thrower attacks the zone. So far, we've seen that. Just pumping what? heaters in there, right? <laughs> hey, 83, 83 miles an hour with a little bit of run on it. I've seen much slower from position players this season. 12 extra base hits for the Brewers that matches a franchise record. Yeah, 83.3. Be curious to see if Travis could get to two strikes, if he can find that old curveball that he had in the minor leagues or somewhere in Little League. Right here would be a good time for it. <laughs> little one, two, throw a little frisbee up there. He sees got a little smile going on right now, a smirk on his face. He jams RC with a heater in. If he could ever muster up that curveball, this would be a good time to do it. How about if he locks our C up here with a 12 to 6 Shane Bieber curveball? There it is! Oh. <laughs> 
75er. Oh. The old there if you'll oh throw it gosh. one, two, throw it two, two. How about it, Sean? Come on, Travis. Let oh. us see that hook. Oh. Oh. Oh, the heat. Oh. Backhanded stop it short. Oh, Castro airmails it. Apparently, Demerit in his junior year of high school was clocked at 91. You wow. could see by his delivery that he has pitched somewhere in his past. His delivery is very clean. Arcia hits a bullet right here in the hole. I know, Count. I... Oh, Demerit's like, ah, I want to get out of here. <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> this is dicey. You know, talking to Counts before the game, talking about RC, he said he's been hitting the ball hard all year long, just hasn't had a ton of luck. Well, he's got four hits today, and he's hit the ball hard all four of those times. Oh. oh. Luis Arias, 83, a little chin music. StatCast powered by Google Cloud. Look at him at the hot corner. Arias is like, it's all good. My arm strength's ridiculous. Wow. 125 feet to throw that ball on a line. Originally called safe, but instant replay review oh. and out recorded oh. by Arias. Er That's a really fantastic play. He wants that pitch back. Okay, that play was unbelievable, but that pitch right there that was 80 miles <laughs> right down the middle, he wants that back. Yeah, you could see Demer. He started to labor a little bit right now. That 83 84. Oh, he jammed him. It's falling in though. Yeah, it is. But it's Arias. one of those days. It's one of those days for the Brewers, right? Yeah. Everything's falling in. The Tigers are like, let's get this all out of the way. Wow. And there's Arcia to make it 17 runs. I think one of the things if you're Ron Gardner, you take a look at him there with that mask on. The last thing you want to do is to leave a position player out there, you know, have a chance to hurt his elbow or his shoulder. You have that little bit of an adrenaline rush. You get out there and you do something you haven't done since high school. Yeah. yeah there's a fastball that's 82 miles an hour. Yelich started the inning with that bullet to shortstop. Looked like it might be a potentially easy one, two, three oh, inning, and look boy. out. Tyrone Taylor. Goodbye. So, you want to be a pitcher, Sean Casey? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Wow. A new franchise record for a single game. 13 extra base hits for the Brewers. And Tyrone Taylor has a home run and a four-hit day. Three extra base hits of his own. The first of his career. Wow, congratulations. First home run. He'll remember that forever. Gonna tell his grandkids. My this first could be career homer. Did you hit it off a of Burlander? <laughs> I hit it, hit it off a of Burlander in yeah. Detroit. <laughs> it was Demerit. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember him on the mound. No, who'd you hit off a of? Burlander? Burlander. <laughs> <laughs> this could be tr another guy's. The way Demerit's throwing, I'm just saying, he's got that one pitch. It's really a batting practice fastball. You might see Nottingham get one too. This is when you start licking your chops as a hitter. Jacob Nottingham already has one. Mm. Loads up. Got under it. Oh, Jorge Bonifacio puts the pain away. A few more for Milwaukee. Homers for Jerko and Taylor. Last of the ninth for Detroit on the way. Oh. Ah. Ah. Two, 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 two. In one out, one down. Started.
Oh boy. Two, two, two. Got you down. Remember back in the day when the Packers used to play one game a year at County Stadium? This is a football score. We've got our scoreboards confused here. Packers 19, Lions nothing. In fact, there's only been one shutout of the Lions by the Packers since 1946 that involved more points than the Brewers have scored runs today. From this Michigander to you, Scott, I'll send it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Midwest. Tied for fifth most in a game in franchise history, the 19 runs from the Brew Crew. Here's Ford Field. Just a Luis Urias throw away from Comerica. And here is Josh Lindblom. ERA above six. Pitched in this series last week between these two teams. They split two games last week. And we are on our way to seeing the same result in this little two game set. Detroit winning yesterday 8 3. The Brewers have 19 runs. Scott Braun, Sean Casey, Dan Plesak, and you just heard from JP Morosi. Much more info for you on both sides on the post game show afterward. Talk about. The playoff stretch for both sides. Yes, it doesn't look pretty today for Detroit. But they are just three games below the 500 mark after this one. And it would drop them to one and a half back of the Yankees for the final playoff spot. Who knew the Yankees might need that final <laughs> playoff spot. Crazy, we're even having that conversation. Lynn Bloom inside out to right, and that's a nice little shoestring grab for Taylor. Have a day. This is the 15th annual Roberto Clemente Day, and we remember him today both for his contributions on and especially off the field as well. The Hall of Famer, two time World Series champ, MVP. I mean, he did it all. You want to talk about toolsy on the field. A four time batting champ. He was a career 317 hitter, but also known for everything that he did for his homeland, Puerto Rico. Grew the game internationally, hosted clinics for underprivileged youth, raised financial aid for various Latin American countries, and unfortunately passed away tragically on a humanitarian mission to earthquake victims in Nicaragua on New Year's Eve in 1972. We think back and Remember the greatness of Roberto Clemente, number 21. There's a bouncing ball for out number two. Eric Sogard in there at second for Keston Hira. Dirty scorecard today, Case. Really, it's so funny to look it's just at just a mess. It's so funny to look at the scorecard. I, I turned it over to Milwaukee. It's like it just looks like a crossword puzzle. There. There's like 85 <laughs> words in it. And I turned it over. The other. It looks like looks like a nothing blank page for the Tigers. Story of the day for the Brewers. Corbin Burns with one out to go. He'll move to three and zero on the year with an ERA of under two at one point nine nine seven powerhouse innings. One hit one allowed over the minimum. 22 batters faced in seven innings with no strikeouts, no walks in 11 strikeouts. Corbin Burns. I liked what you said, Dan. You got Burns. If he keeps pitching the way he has, Woodruff and Hauser in that rotation, and this team starts hitting like this, you're right. The, the Brewers could make that nine, what, nine and one run, you know, uh, and make a big run here down the stretch these last few weeks to get right where they want to be. And what was more impressive, it's not easy to pitch when you have such a big lead. Brewers had a couple of long innings and 
Burns was able to stay focused and composed, and that'll do it. That's right. Caught by Taylor, who had a big day, along with many other Brewers. Game over. 19-0. The Brewers take it. And it is time for the MLB Game of the Week, live on YouTube post-game show. This is one of those all-around performances. The Brewers with the defense, with the pitching, and a lot of thump. Bringing the extra base hits in bunches. They set a franchise record for extra base hits in a single game. 13 of them. Actually, the last time in all of Major League Baseball that we saw at least 19 runs in a shutout, Milwaukee did it back in 2010 with a 20 to nothing win. So today it's 19-0. And that's how you come back from a loss yesterday against the Tigers 8-3. So they split the season series. Each team won two games per side. Corbin Burns putting on such a show. He's going to join us after the celebration here on the field for the Brewers as they get a much-deserved, well-earned day off tomorrow before they continue their stretch run, which includes many games coming up against the team in front of them in the NL Central. That would be the St. Louis Cardinals. Beautiful ballpark in Comerica, overcast day, and the Tigers just did not have it from Matt Boyd on the mound and also coming up very empty against Corbin Burns. He'll join us in just a moment, making his sixth start of the season, and this one was as good as it gets. The previous two, six innings, he was fantastic as well in both of those outings. A career-high six innings in back-to-back -back outings until today. Going seven, Scott Braun, Sean Casey, Dan Plesak. Wow. I mean, we saw Cor Corbin Burns with his finest performance probably of his career with the strikeouts and the swing and miss stuff from the get-go. He was terrific. 11 strikeouts, no walks, one hit, and seven powerhouse innings, as good as I've ever seen him composed. He was very decisive on the mound, pitching to both sides of the plate without a doubt the best I've ever seen him. You could tell by pitch one when Burns was attacking the zone, throwing with conviction, crisscrossing the plate, had pa pa power sinker, power cutter all day long. He really uh, – and, and, and you know when you look at big league hitters, how they swing the bat, when they're taking some of the swings they took tonight, you knew Burns was nasty. The big leagues will humble you. I mean, he was so good in 2018, and then in 2019 he got smacked around, and Gre Craig Council spoke to us this morning and said, hey – you can't be as predictable. You have to use both sides of the plate. These are big league hitters. You have nasty stuff. But, Dan, it takes more than that. It takes a little craft. A lot of craft. And I think what he's learning to do, he's learning how to use his weapons. But I think, one, most importantly, he's throwing the ball on both sides of the plate. We saw a, cutter, a couple of backdoor cutters that he was able to get some strikeouts. And he was able to go slider, slider, cutter, cutter back-to-back -back when you're throwing a good one. That one right there, that backdoor breaking ball, that's a nearly impossible pitch to do anything with. He was terrific. And right now, if I'm Craig Council and I'm just watching this game, and if I'm Chris Hook, their pitching coach, this is a game that you'd like to put on a video for Corbin Burns and just to have him watch it because he was inside of his mechanics the entire day. Very rarely, if at all, fell off towards the first base side. This was as good as I've ever seen him. One base runner over the limit through seven innings. StatCast powered by Google Cloud showing off the 11 strikeouts. Yeah, no walks. It was just Willie Castro with a triple. Otherwise, 39 swings, 16 whiffs. He was sitting 96 with the fastball. The cutter is the weapon that he just keeps on using more and more because it has worked for him. Last year, he used the pitch not 8% of the time, Eight times total, now about a quarter of his pitches this year are the cutter. So let's run through what we just witnessed here live on YouTube. The Brewers and the Tigers finishing up their season series this afternoon. It's a ground rule double for the Brewers shortstop. Here's Luis Arias, and he shoots a ball to left, and that finds some open space, and that'll score the first run of the game. Arcia trots home. It's an RBI double for Luis Arias. 1-0 Milwaukee. Good hustle right there by Arias, too. That's a ball that got in the gap, didn't shoot it, and Arias does a great job of getting out of the box fast, thinking double. Right when he hit it, he thought, I'm getting, to, I'm getting it, too. 
Great piece of base runner right there. That's not that bad of a walk with a base open right there, Sean. You do set yourself up for the double play. That pitch is shot to left. Oh, another one. Another one similar spot. Avisail Garcia connects. And the Brewers have another. Boy, man, this has been a struggle this second inning so far for Matt Boyd. Matt Boyd going up against Jed Jerko right now. Uh-oh. Go. Jed Jerko going oh, the other way. Jed and G. Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> Jed Jerko uh, muscles up for his sixth home run of the season, and the Brewers are up 4-0. That's the pitch I'm talking about. Up and away above the zone. Jerko does a great job kind of staying above the baseball, keeping his hands level, and really driving down through it. He's able to create some great backspin to get that ball out to right. It is an infield knock for Tyrone Taylor. Nottingham lifts that one deep to left, and Bonifacio will give it a look. He has no play. It's gone. Jacob Nottingham powers up for two, and Milwaukee's up 6 hit. Well, the home run has cost Matt Boyd. We touched on it coming into this start. 50 home runs he's allowed since the beginning of the 2019 season. Brew Crew playing some long ball. Second home run they've hit on the day. Well, on to first base he goes, and Garcia will move his way up as well. Ryan Braun past shortstop, and that is going to be a play oh, at the plate. And did he ever touch home? Yeah, he's in there. He's safe. Avisail Garcia scores with a smile. And Ryan Braun drives in the seventh run for Milwaukee. And the storyline belongs to Corbin Burns. Perfect through four, Dan. Well, 12 up, 12 down. After the Castro ground out. And that one going to deep right center. And it is high off the wall. First hit of the day for Detroit. Willie Castro with a triple off of Corbin Burns here in the fifth. Six game hit streak hitting over 400 during that span spoils the perfect game bid and the no no two triples on the year for Castro. Avisail Garcia has his second double of the day. He's reached base three times unleashes there you go. There you go. and finds plenty of open real estate and that's going to bring in Garcia. That's the swing that we saw last year in 2018 that made this guy a National League MVP. Base is loaded now and Luis Arias will step in. That one is shipped to left and it's going to fall in fair ground and it'll clear the bases. Luis Arias with the double to knock in three. It's 11 nothing Milwaukee. This game is for the most part out of hand. The hit parade continues. Tyron Taylor is feeling good. Arias scores 12 zip Milwaukee. That left field corner is getting worn out. I'd love to see this guy swinging like that. Ryan Braun goes long. Wow. Braun for two. It's 15 nothing. You know, you, you hang one to Ryan Braun like that. You hang it, he bangs it. And that ball was out over the plate, just kind of sitting up there. Was, he was able to really get his arms extended and really skies this ball to left field. But wait, there's more to the ninth inning we go. And this is Derek Hill on its way to right. And there's the catch by Taylor. To end the ball game. 19 nothing. Milwaukee with a huge W and the man of the hour Corbin Burns seven shutout innings 11 strikeouts joining us live on YouTube we appreciate the time and thanks for waiting the highlight Corbin took forever because the offense was ridiculous too <laughs> how would you sum up the day. Uh, it was great. Um, you know, those guys came out and swing the bat early and, uh, you know, really freed me up on the mound go out and uh, attack early and uh, you know, Nadia did a great job back there calling the game. Corbin, would you say this is your best start as a big leaguer? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I was able to go out and have a good, uh, you know, pitch mix today and attack the zone early and, uh, you know, I was able to get through seven. Backdoor slider, you use that repeatedly to the lefties. Is that a pitch you've worked on? It is. It's, it's actually a pitch I just started throwing this year. Um, we were kind of playing with it in uh, actually spring training, and then uh, so worked on it over quarantine, and then came back in summer camp. And um, you know, over the last three or four starts, it's really starting to to be a pitch that we can uh, you know get punch outs with. Corbin, with you being obviously as nasty as you were today, and you look at Woodruff and Hauser in that rotation, your bullpen the way it is, if the bats get going, what do you guys feel like your chances are moving forward in these next three weeks? I think we got a good chance. Um, you know, with, with everyone, you know, we got 10 games with the Cardinals coming up, so that's uh, that's obviously obviously going to help us uh, as far as the standings go. But um, you know, late in the ninth inning last night, the, you know, the guys started swinging the bat and they came in the day with the hit parade. So um, you know, if we can keep swinging the bat, keep pitching like we can, uh, you know, we got a good chance.
you know, you'd like to get some run support. Was it difficult? You had some long innings where you guys were up there for 15, 20 minutes. Was it difficult staying loose, going back out? Yeah, you know, you just try to stay as locked in as you can. Um, you know, in between innings, I try not to do, try not to, you know, wander from the game too much with those long innings. It makes it tough. But um, yeah, we were able to, you know, go out and attack early, and you know, they they swing the bat pretty um, pretty often early. So that definitely helped to uh, to get through those long innings and get into the seventh. You were perfect up until the fifth inning of Willie Castro triple. Was it on your mind at all? It's always the question that goes through a pitcher's head, especially when you get almost halfway through the game and nothing was happening for the offense. Did you think, hey, there haven't been any hits yet in this ball game? I haven't even let anyone on base. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know I was perfect. Um, I, I knew the no hitter was gone. Um, you know, sit here at Comerica Park, the scoreboard's sitting there staring you in the face, so you can <laughs> see it after you come in every half inning. But uh, no, I, I hadn't realized I hadn't walked a guy until uh, until I came in after the game. Corbin, what's the biggest difference in your game from last year to 2020? Just a different pitch mix. Um, you know, last year we got in trouble with everything working the same direction. So um, the focus of this offseason was to, uh, you know, to, to get something that I can run into righties, run away from lefties. So that's where the, you know, the two seam sinker came, came from, and then uh, just really developed a changeup. And you know, the change has been a plus plus this year. So just be able to do that, and uh, you know, having the having the uh, the mental game to go behind it definitely has helped me, uh, you know, roll over from last year. Is there anything that you do personally to get yourself pumped up? Also, how do you get yourself into that good range for a start when there isn't a crowd out there? I know some starters say they have to kind of figure out other ways to get themselves hyped up, but then you don't want to be too pumped for a start like this. You need to be under control. Yeah, for me, it's more about um, staying calm and staying under control. Um, you know, I don't really have have an issue getting getting the adrenaline and getting pumped up out there. So for me, um, you know, just finding ways to stay calm, stay under control, um, going through my breathing, just you know, whatever I can, just to keep you know keep my feet underneath me. Well, Dan was pumped up for that start. <laughs> I was. You know what I think was so impressive <laughs> to watch Corbin is I think watching you pitch now. You have a weapon for everybody. It's not just all to the glove side where a, a lefty that likes the ball in, you're, you're kind of thrown into their wheelhouse. I was really impressed today of your moving, not only your fastball, but your breaking ball on both sides of the plate. Do you feel now that you have a weapon for anybody that comes up there, whether they're a lefty that likes it in or a righty that likes it away, you have something that you can throw them off with? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, last year we, we kind of got stuck with you know, really only having the wipeout pitches of the right-hander. So um, that was kind of the thing we wanted to focus on this offseason was, hey, we need something running, running into righties, running away from lefties, the change up, and, um, you know, the pitch mix we're running with right now is uh, it's really working. Yeah, it is working, and we're showing it, the pitch arsenal in 2020. Let's finish with this. We saw Eric Yardley, but no Josh Hader or Devin Williams, and Craig Council told us before the game if it was close, he would use them. Clearly, that was not the case. But how nasty have those three been out of the bullpen? How fun is it to watch those guys? And also know that if you bring them a lead, you're in good hands. Yeah, no, it's it's been great. Um, you know, when it when it's a close game, to give it out to those guys, it's definitely uh, you're definitely sitting in a comfortable spot in the dugout. Um, you know, Yardley coming from down under with that sinker. I wish I could throw a sinker like that. And then uh, I mean, obviously, haters hater. Um, you know, he can get you out with a fastball, a slider. He's got a change up. He hasn't even thrown it this year. So, um, and then you know, the, the pitch that everyone loves is is the Devin Williams change up. I'm still still trying to work on that one. If I can add that one, then I'll, then I'll feel really good about myself. <laughs> yeah, some good teammates to learn from for extra pitches. That's true, Corbin. Definitely. Thanks Definitely. for hanging with us. Congrats on the W. Enjoy the off day tomorrow. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. That's Corbin Burns. Great conversation with him. And he has that confidence. Scott, you touched on it. Listen, there's one thing as a pitcher, whether it's a reliever or a starter, when you walk out of that bullpen mound and you walk onto that field, you're one of two things. You're either going to hunt them or they're going to hunt you. And he seemed to me, Sean, like a guy that was initiating the action. He was aggressive throwing strike one. And it's not an easy thing to do when you have a three-run inning, a five-run inning. You sit down for 15 or 20 minutes. He was attacking the strike zone. He wasn't throwing. He was pitching with really good stuff. It was awfully impressive. No, I love it too, Danny. You know, that pitch, that pitch right there, the cutter, that he throws – upwards of 28 uh, percent this year only threw it eight times last year for me that was an equalizer that was a pitch that i hated to face because as a lefty that right-handed pitcher could bear it in on my hands and you saw that today he was bearing that cutter in on the lefty's hands and sometimes back doing it but he also had that wipeout sinker away just a absolute clinic today from corbin burns
And let's run through why he had to wait so long between some of his innings. The Brewers put up 13 extra base hits. 13, a franchise record in a single game. Satcast powered by Google Cloud. I like this note too. Eight doubles, five home runs. Look at them punish the baseball this afternoon. So they put up 19 runs on the anniversary of Robin Yount's 3,000th hit. And what number was Robin Yao? Number 19. That's wow. right. I love it. Oh, uh, that's coming for full that's circle. Awesome. Our boy so Matt cool. Baker and research. Best in the biz. Today, 13 extra base hits, 19 runs. First three games, seven runs, 26 hits, seven extra base hits. You look at the last four games, and they put on a show offensively. J.P. Morosi is going to put a bow on this game from Comerica Park. Scott, thanks so much, and great to be on the show again with you today. The Milwaukee Brewers actually now become fans of their opponents from Detroit because the Tigers now play a doubleheader against the St. Louis Cardinals tomorrow, the team the Brewers are chasing, and now just within two games of St. Louis here today. And it's important to note, of course, as well from the Tigers' standpoint, still just one game back in the loss column from the New York Yankees. As, as you pointed out, Scott, all the runs they scored, Corbin Burns was so outstanding if the Brewers scored one run today, it may have been enough for Milwaukee to win this ballgame. So the Tigers certainly taking this loss, but still some momentum for them tomorrow, although they have to face now Jack Flaherty of St. Louis tomorrow. They will counter with Tarek Skubal, the rookie pitcher there for the Tigers. One more note from Detroit's standpoint. Daz Cameron making his Major League debut today against his father Mike's former team, one of them, of course, the Milwaukee Brewers. And Daz Cameron told reporters today, in fact, that during the course of the summer, he did have COVID-19 and also pneumonia that he battled. Basically, he was sick for a month. So just for Daz to be able to get up here to the major leagues, he's been working a lot with Alan Trammell and Larry Herndon there in the minor leagues there at Toledo. So certainly for Daz to be able to get to the major leagues, a great day for the Cameron family. Congratulations to them, even as the Tigers lose here this afternoon. Also, Scott, let's not forget here, it is Roberto Clemente Day. More importantly than anything else, any result here in the game this afternoon, I'm really excited to see the Pirates all wearing 21 this evening. And certainly, Scott, today I reflected back on the trip I took to Puerto Rico a couple years ago when the plaque was dedicated in honor of Roberto Clemente at the spot on the beach nearest to where uh, it's believed by officials there that his plane went down on the relief mission on New Year's Eve in 1972. And I still remember his son, Luis, touching that plaque and breaking down into tears, thinking about the time with his father that he lost, of course, Roberto Clemente, just 38 years of age at the time that he died. And I think everybody, Scott, around the game, whether it's players, broadcasters, fans, this day every year gives us a time to think about how our impact is in the world, what more we can all do to help those who are less fortunate, as Roberto Clemente did so much throughout his life. And certainly one of those honorees, Scott, early on in the Clemente Award back in 1973, number six who played here. The late, great Al Kaline won that award in 1973. Scott? Thank you, JP. That's a great report. And, hey, you won that award, yeah. too. And, you know, where is that award, first of it's all? It's right, right, on, right, on uh, right when you walk into my house to the right, I got a memorabilia room, and it's sitting right there. And it's, I also have a Roberto Clemente statue, the one that's outside of PNC Park. They made some uh, smaller models of it, and I have it. Uh, you know, because I, I think one thing, you know, when you, when you talk Roberto Clemente, like JP was talking about, the impact – that he had. You know, he was a great baseball player, but but the impact he had in the Latino community, the impact that he had in Pittsburgh, the impact he had all around Major League Baseball, uh, the impact he had um, helping out, uh, you know, the refugees and all that, all the stuff that he did. I think, Danny, that's why Roberto Clemente is, is, is his name and his number. Hopefully one day will be retired. And I love that's Roberto Clemente Day, but the impact he had on baseball in this world is unbelievable. When you think of the Pittsburgh Pirates, you think of Roberto Clemente, and he's one of the guys that you could watch film of Roberto Clemente, his game translated. If he played in 2020, he would be a star yeah. player now. He played with flair. He played with dignity. He played with class. His teammates love him. His uh, opponents, they revered him. They respected him. They honored him. A great man on and off the field. I agree with you. Someday, number 21 should be retired. Nice. Yeah, and if you want to learn more about Roberto Clemente, first off, on this feed, on this stream, you can go further backwards. Just rewind to the beginning of the show. There's a great conversation with Jason Stark, Harold Reynolds, 
and Pedro Martinez about the great number 21. Uh, plenty you can do on YouTube to search him and watch videos on the great number 21. Hey, also on YouTube, we have the Royals and Brewers on Friday, September 18th. That's the next live game that you can catch right here, and it looks like this. Tell me, are you ready? Here in Milwaukee, it is a beautiful night for a baseball game. Now we fully charged, now we ready to go. We gonna take it higher. That ball is lifted. And it is gone. This is a no doubt about her. Back-to-back -back bombs by Soler and Perez. Braun rips one down the left field line. And the Brewers have tied it in the ninth. Line down the left field line. That's going to get down. And the Brewers have a 6-5 lead here in the 11th. Big Friday, big Saturday, big Sunday, big Monday. Josh Hader comes in, goes three up and three down to the White Sox. Barricades in the first inning of 2020 for Brad Keller. 2-2 two -two coming. Got him. He strikes out the side. And Devin Williams with a clean eighth inning. Middle diving stop. Oh my goodness. Back up the middle. Oh, nice stop. Arias. I'm still sitting here in shock. That's his seventh K of the night. Wow. And the Royals have erupted here. Man, Justin Hira just clobbered that ball. Whit Merrifield has led the majors in hits each of the last two seasons. On the ground and throw. Into left field. The base set. Here comes Gamble. Has a prize. Take the lead. Bubba Starling comes through. That's a beautiful job. There's a fly ball hit back into right field. It's deep. It is gone. And the Brewers win it. Aaron Sogard walks in. And I think that's what makes Brewers fans so excited is that they've had that mojo for the past couple years when it gets to this time of year. I know it's a weird season. It's different. But, hey, it's September. They see that on the calendar, and things change. It has been a very down year across the board offensively for the Brewers. Christian Yelich, one big ringing double this afternoon. They need to get him going. This is a team that has lost a lot of home runs. No Yasmani Grandal, no Eric Thames in that lineup. They're missing a lot of home run power. They thought they were going to get some of that back. It's been a slow start for Braun, a slow start for Yelich. If they can get going, the one thing if I'm a Brewers fan that I'm excited about, their starting pitching is far better off right now than it's been the last couple of years. Well, their starting pitching's great. That bullpen obviously is unbelievable. This lineup's got to get going. And I tell you what, baseball's a funny game. When you're in it for a sprint for two months, you could have a bad month. This season, you can't. So the Brewers are kind of, they're sitting around that 500 mark. They have the ability with the rotation, with that bullpen. And if this lineup can hit, semi what they did today and get get those sticks going they got a shot to make a run in these next couple weeks and that was the problem Yelich couldn't find a hit for the first week ish of the season i think he was one for 20 something to start the uh, 2020 campaign but are you seeing positive indicators of well, future success well i think today you know uh, early on you saw him take a couple bad swings against boyd kind of looked like he was bailing out with that front side but later on, I think that when you when you saw him come up, this is the second inning again went against Boy. See, he has a lot of balls that are ground balls to the right side this year. That's why teams are starting to shift on him because he's rolling over the ball like he usually doesn't do. He comes up in the fourth here, gets a pitch to do something with. Usually, you know, we, we talked about it earlier. He would have hammered this pitch, but kind of got it off the end and lazily hits it the left field. But this is the pitch right here. We were talking about this, Danny. The, the pitch, he got a ball middle in, and he's able to stay inside it and really drive him to the gap. And that's the Christian Yelich we know. And if he can start doing that, because when he hits, they win. When he doesn't hit, they don't win. Statcast powered by Google Cloud. Almost 108 miles an hour off the bat. You're looking for loud contact. There's been plenty of it from that man in the past couple years. And then one more at bat in the seven. Yeah, well, it was nice. He got he got a walk and then it, and uh, you know worked the walk there. Then the ninth, he oh, came I forgot up about this. Obviously facing <laughs> uh, position player. He hit it hard. And he did hit it hard. So 
his last his last three at bats he doubles in the gap he walks and then he hits a bullet to shortstop i don't know for me if i'm christian yelts i'm feeling pretty good going into the next game he's been on base in 28 straight games that's the longest streak in the national league second longest in all of major league baseball to alex bregman so yes there have been some swing and misses that you don't, usually don't see from him he has definitely not been on every pitch like he's been in the past a 2018 MVP. You know what's cool too, Brawny? I was just checking this out. 19 runs for Yao. 21 hits today, Clemente Day. 21 hits. That's pretty That's cool. That's right. Huh? That's pretty cool. 19 <laughs> runs for Robin Yao and that number in the anniversary of, of 3,000 for him. And then 21 hits. This is Roberto Clemente Day. So on September 18th, when we have the Brewers and the Royals again, quick note here on Kansas City. This is a team that's in an AL Central. I'll say this, Dan. When we looked at the season coming in, we said, well, the AL Central, that's where the Indians and the Twins can pick on everyone else. Every team looks a little bit better than we thought. I should say the White Sox as well. We looked at it as a solid ball club, and you said, oh, the Tigers, they're rebuilding. The Royals, they're rebuilding. Neither of them have been easy. They haven't been, and I think a couple of bright spots. Jorge Soler has turned himself into a middle part of that order. The guy that's been a little bit disappointing has been Mondesi. He had a big home run the other night in Cleveland, his first of the year. They have some good, young, exciting young players that haven't quite been as good, I think, as they had hoped up to this point. You look at the central standings. This Tigers team is a lot better than a lot of people thought they were. The Royals pulling up the bottom, but their young position players are on their way, and their general manager, Dayton Moore, thinks that they're on their way, that next year may be the year they get appreciably better. They have some good young starting rotation. Their bullpen options, they traded Trevor Rosenthal, who is a guy going into this COVID-19. They kind of rebirthed. They moved him to the San Diego Padres. It's a young team that's getting better, but right now this is probably a little bit too soon for the Kansas City Royals. I also think Mike Matheny is the right guy for that for that club with the young kids coming in with the mix of the veteran guys. But Mondesi is the one guy. I really think, you know, with with how fast he is and how dynamic he is, yeah, he just hit his first home run the other day. I, I think I'd like to see him pick it up. And, you know, I think there's superstar potential in that guy. And that home run was a rocket. It was a bullet. I mean, he has tons of tools with the homers and the speed. You can see him in that game coming very soon right here on YouTube. Stalmont in the back end of the bullpen has been awesome for Kansas City as well. So that's when we'll see you again for the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube next Friday. Yelich and the Brew Crew hosting Alex Gordon and the Kansas City Royals as coverage begins with our pregame show at 7.30 Eastern. For Dan Plesak, Sean Casey, J.P. Morosi, and our entire crew, I am Scott Braun, logging out for now. This was all Brewers, Corbin Burns, and the offense, the fancy defense as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on YouTube.